What's going on? What's going on? Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Martin Wilson, and we have a great one for you today. Uh, a good old King James Version Bible debate. Man, you can't get enough of these guys, man. If you're a big fan of this stuff, get ready for a great debate. I have PJ James and Nick Sayers, and these guys are really going to be talking about some good stuff, man. As I mentioned previously, this is probably one of my weakest areas as far as, far as it comes to the, the world of Christianity, the studying the text, the, the studying of the Bible. King J version only issues is probably one of my weaker issues. So I'm personally a little bit excited. I hope you're excited with me. If you are as excited as I am, that should motivate you to like and follow and subscribe. Take time to like or follow and subscribe the Gospel Truth. Make sure you're doing that. If you plan on leaving this debate early, because I know it's probably getting late to some in some areas, make sure that you subscribe now. Don't leave the show without subscribing, because it will benefit the ministry to have your support. All right, become one of the family, the Gospel Truth family. Become a member by subscribing. Um, you can subscribe on YouTube, obviously, and on Facebook, you go ahead and like. Hit that like button. And on both YouTube and Facebook, go ahead and hit that notification bell so that you'll be up to par on all that comes up, right? You don't miss any debates. And I have some exciting shows coming up, so you don't want to miss these shows. Uh, also, all this content is on podcasts. So go ahead, flow over to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and make sure that you are subscribing there. And while you're there, if the content, if you find the content good, if you appreciate the content, Make sure you leave a good rating too. What's the harm there? Go ahead and leave a good rating on the podcast as well. With that said, before I bring PJ and Nick in, I do want to go ahead and go over a couple of announcements of shows that I have coming up here in the future. All right, I have coming up July 17th. This is going to be a big debate. Um, this is Mr. Eric Hernandez versus Aaron Ra. And they're going to debate, does the soul exist? This is a, a big one. Aaron Ra and Eric Hernandez have some history. And this is going to be a great debate. So make sure you mark your candidates for that one. After that, I have Emilio Ramos versus Tom Jump. Tom Jump is probably one of the more popular internet atheists that are out there. Uh, he, hit, he hit the hit it with a with a... He hit it hard. You know, he came onto the scene and he really hit it hard. Um, and Emilio Ramos is a pastor and he is big time with the precept. I mean, he's one of the best out there and he's good friends with uh, Mr. Eli Ayala. And I'm excited for this debate. This is going to be great. This is coming up July 21st at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. After that, I have uh, Jim Majors versus Michael Jones, inspiring philosophy himself. Atheist versus Christian debate. These are some good debates, man. Was Jesus buried in a tomb? Man, you better tune into this one, man. This is going to be an exciting one as well. Uh, Mike Jones is a cool cat, man. And uh, I think he's going to perform really well. After that, I have Jack Shannon, Stephen Boyce. Does the Bible teach that remarriage is always simple? That's coming up July 27th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This debate was already supposed to happen, but due to technical difficulties, it got postponed, and they're jumping right back in there July 27th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Once again, that's just the next four shows coming up on A Gospel Truth. So make sure that you are subscribing and liking. I cannot emphasize that enough. If you are hesitant, what are you hesitating for? The gospel truth is here to engage the culture with Christian truth. And we through that we do that through debates, interviews, and lessons. Uh, also, might I also add, if you scroll down to the bottom of the YouTube page on the gospel truth page, you'll see this section that says, let's talk. I'm going to be revamping let's talk a little bit. It, it, it's going to be centered around biblical teaching. But I'm also going to be engaging with more political stuff there. You know, how the Christian should engage with the political aspect of this world and different cultural things that are happening within the news. So there's a bit of a revamp going on with that. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, with that said, let me bring on, bring in Mr. PJ and Mr. Nick Sayers. Let me bring them on, to bring them on in so they can say hi. What's up, guys? How y'all doing? How you doing? Good, thanks. All right, glad to see you. So, Nick, you're all the way from Australia, huh? From Australia, it's the middle of winter here. We're freezing cold. Ooh -wee. But um, I'm representing New York City here. I see, I see what you're doing over there, Nick. I see you, man. It's polar opposites over here. It's cold over there. 
I'm from the desert. I'm up there in India, and it's 120 degrees right now, man. It is scorching hot, Whoa. man. <laughs> brutal. Yes. Whoa is the correct term. It's brutal, man. What's up, PJ? How you doing, buddy? Hang in there, my friend. I'm trying to make it through all this COVID stuff. Oh, this stuff was crazy, man. Like I told you before the show, man, California locked us down again, man. And we are yeah. back at phase one. So who knows when all this is letting <laughs> up, man? Who knows? Who knows, man? But with that said, man, we're going to go ahead and get into this debate. But before we get into it, get to the format, I want to go ahead and give you guys an opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience. So start with Mr. PJ. Go ahead and give a quick introduction, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, as he said, my name is just a regular old guy. I work every day. I go to have any uh, necessarily re religious or biblical, uh, you know, kind of accolades to, to gloat about. But I have been around these topics and religious topics for over 20 years. Um, I've really devoted a lot of free time uh, to it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to engaging with Nick. Um, it's the first time doing one virtually. I usually do most debates face to face. So. Hopefully, uh, me and Nick can entertain the masses while also educating the masses as well, obviously, for, for a good cause. So, All right, all right. Thank you, PJ, once again, for coming on the Gospel Truth, man. All right, Nick Sayers, go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Hey, guys, my name's Nick Sayers. I'm from Australia, and um, I have been working on Bible versions and Bible issues for many years. I've been a Christian since 1995. And um, I've written many articles about uh, the King James Bible. I used to think the King James Bible had mistakes in it. And so I've written articles about the journey um, in that. And uh, I lived in Pakistan for a year in 2016, working on an Urdu Bible translation. And so that was pretty radical. And if anyone wants to come over and do some evangelism over in Pakistan, you can come with me. It'll be awesome. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's me. All right. All right. Thank you once again, fellas, for coming on the Gospel Truth. And, you know, when people come on Gospel Truth for, for debates, man, you guys are embracing to the family, man. You're part of the Gospel Truth family, man. You know, so welcome to the family, man. And let's get into this debate, man. So the, the title is, is, does the King James Version Bible, is it, 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 does history show that it's without error? All right, so that's the topic of today's debate. Uh, we're going to start off with 15-minute opening statements. Then we're going to have 10-minute cross-examinations. After that, we're going to follow up with a 40-minute discussion. Both of you guys will get two 10-minute opportunities to ask questions. After that, 10-minute closings, and then Q&A from the audience. Everything sounds good? Sounds good. All right, we had a... Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see. Oh, yeah, so Nick Sayers, you are arguing the affirmatives on this debate. PJ, you're arguing the negative. So P, uh, for Nick, you're up for your... Um... Also, before we go, remember the time I showed you. Uh, keep an eye on that time um, so you know. And once again, you'll hear this chime um, when you're at one minute, at the one minute mark. So make sure you keep that in mind. So with that said, Nick, you are up for your 15 minute opening, man. Awesome. Thanks, Marlon. And nice to meet you, PJ. Um... I will just explain why I believe the King James Bible is perfect. Um, uh, my personal testimony is I used to be um, into drugs. I used to drink uh, from when I was very young into that sort of lifestyle. And um, I got to the stage when I was about 18 years old and I was a drug dealer, <laughs> had all these guys after me and all, all sorts of problems. And I was given an NIV Bible. And so I started to read the Bible. I thought, well, I'll give this Bible a chance. And so I read through to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, it had a footnote that said that they weren't sure um, whether the verse was in there or not. And I just thought to myself, oh, this is insane. And I just threw the, the Bible in the corner and just thought, um, <laughs> who would read a book when they don't even know what the content is? So that's me as a non-Christian. So it was about a year and a half later, I become um, gloriously saved. Um, and I started to read, it was actually a New King James Bible, which didn't have any of those type of footnotes, thankfully, because uh, I know the New King James usually has tons of footnotes. And so I, I've sort of experienced uh, as a non-Christian what it's like to read some of these Bibles. And to I believe that the problem with this generation with atheism and, and a whole heap of other issues 
is because the Bible is uh, so degraded, and I believe it's being degraded by scholars. Uh, I think there's so much confusion over what the Bible is that people just, uh, a lot of Christians are totally confused. Uh, a lot of pastors, if I was to ring up any pastor in Australia and say, um, so where is the Bible? And they would say, well, it's in, you know, the versions. And it's like, well, which one? Well, you know, just choose one that's comfortable to you. It's like, no, which which one is the Bible? And it's, uh, you know, if you say King James, oh, you're, you're a cultist, apparently. You're a King James only cultist. And, you know, King James only carries a lot of baggage. You know, it's a bit like the label Black Lives Matter. You know, it doesn't mean that uh, if you can say, I, I believe Black Lives Matter, but if you say I'm part of Black Lives Matter, it carries a whole bunch of baggage. King James only, the tag, uh, usually carries all this, you know, Ruffin and Gift, all this other stuff, all this other baggage. And that's sort of like a bit of a scarecrow to scare people away from what I believe is the truth. Um, the Bible is very clear that it's not just the concepts or the thoughts or the ideas or the doctrines or the truths of the word of God that are gonna be preserved, but the very words themselves are gonna be preserved. And so I always encourage people to simply do a study in the King James about what the Bible says about itself. If you go through the Bible and you find verses like, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Or the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Um, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Let your kingdom come, you will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So we want the word of God here. And so if, when you do a study into the, the words of God explaining about itself, it's clear that we will have a Bible that lasts forever, a book somewhere, or the words of God will be available somewhere, and we can have access to them. And so... From my examination, when I go through Bible versions, including ones that are based on the Texas Receptus, like the um, the New King James, I just see, I constantly see uh, contradictions. I constantly see amazing contradictions. Um, genealogical errors, uh, where it has the wrong genealogy. Um, geographical areas where Jesus is going to the wrong place. Um, yeah, historical areas where it talks about pe certain people not going into certain places at certain times. And uh, it's, it just, to me, the King James doesn't have these issues. Now, I do street preaching. Now, I would be in the Gold Coast usually street preaching, talking to people of all sorts of faiths or, you know, atheists, agnostics. And so I, I would have, you know, say Muslims approach me and say, you know, we believe the Bible is corrupt. And they would usually use the same arguments that someone like James White would use to basically prove to me that the King James Bible is corrupt. And so um, I find that the greatest apologetic that I have is a Bible that is infallible because I can't point to any of the modern versions um, and say that they are perfect. I can't point to uh, any of the Greek texts, the Tyndale House and Nestle Island, United Bible Society text. I can't point to any of them and say that they're perfect, but I can point to the King James Version, I can point to the Texas Receptors underlying the King James Version and say that the words of God are found there. Um, usually, if you give up your authority, you of the, or if you give up the authority of the Word of God, usually you replace that authority with someone, either yourself or a pastor or some sort of guru or a denomination or some sort of scholar. Um, and this is what this generation's done because they're confused about where the words of God are. So they're scrambling everywhere to find the words of God. And it's like, maybe this pastor has, it, maybe this scholar, you know, I've heard people ring up James White and say, you know, um, you know, where's, what about this particular verse? Where's the words of God here? And, and he just ums and ahs about it. It's like, oh, look, you know, it's, it's there somewhere. You know, he, he doesn't know. J James White and Dan Wallace will be at loggerheads over certain verses say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, that you know, one believes it should be in there, one believes it shouldn't. And so where do we find the words of God? If, if, these, if these are the go-to gurus and they don't know, um, 
no wonder we're producing Bart Ehrmans. No wonder there's so many skeptics out there. And um, I find that the King James Bible is the standard to go to. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, Greenwich Mean Time, that's basically all the clocks are basically uh, they're set to Greenwich Mean Time, which has basically become uh, the international standard. And so we have to have a standard, or else all the other clocks are going to be out of whack. You know, if if we are to measure a meter. Um, we can go to France, we can measure the metre that they have there, where they, where they have the metre there. Um, or, you know, if you're going to examine counterfeit money, you've got to have a, a, a note that is perfect and correct. So you can examine things off and, and look at what is counterfeit. And unfortunately today, most people don't have a standard. They don't have something they can measure off. They're sort of you know, because these Bibles contradict themselves. The you know, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus contradict themselves. And what you have is modern versions. They contradict themselves in so many places. Many times, uh, the, like the NIV will come out and then they'll bring out a new edition that will contradict the older one. And then they'll bring out another one that will contradict the second one. And it's, it's forever changing. You imagine being in the ocean with a GPS like this, where it's just constantly changing direction. You're like, and if you get out of whack just one little bit, it, you can be miles off course. And that's what I see has happened to the church today. The church is so far off course because it doesn't have a standard. It doesn't have um, the, the correct uh, coordinates for the GPS. The King James of the Bible is the most accurate English Bible ever produced. Uh, it doesn't need any further improvements in a sense where I'm not against an update of language, but I believe that the words that uh, have been or that have been translated in that Bible are, um, are accurate and are perfect. Um, and so all other English translations that are on the market at the moment uh, have corruptions to certain degrees, and I can't find those corruptions in the King James Version. Um, let, let's just quickly have a look at some of these corruptions that are in the modern versions. I mean, because I know this is about the accuracy of the King James, but I'm just saying the King James is perfect. I mean, it's sort of hard to just, you know, prove that. What I'm doing is I'm showing you that the other versions are imperfect and that way you can have something to reflect upon. And so in, in the NIV, this is a very popular Bible, in Psalm uh, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, uh, if you get the King James and the NIV together, one will say it's prosperous, the other one will say it's grievous. Ecclesiastes 8.10, one will receive praise in the city or one will be forgotten in the city. It's, it's, it's like the total opposite. Um, in Colossians 2.18, one has seen and one has not seen. And now I've got a list of 15 things here that are just direct opposites. So one um, brings rain and one drives away rain. Yeah, so I'm talking about the exact opposite. Now, wouldn't uh, a critic of the Bible have a field day with this? And just say, well, where's the Bible? One saying this, the other one saying the exact opposite. Um, let's just look at just one example. So if we look at Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6, this is a beautiful verse. It's, it's got a prophetic element. Um, it says, One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And so it's an amazing verse. I love that verse. And so the King James Version says, Wounds in thine hands. You know, obviously Jesus was wounded in his hands, probably his lower hand. Uh, New King James says, wounds between your arms, okay? Um, uh, NIV says, wounds on your body. Amplifier says, wounds on your breast. Uh, New American Standard says, wounds between your arms. Um, uh, revised Standard Version, wounds on your back. Uh, the Revised Version, wounds between thine arms. The Living Bible says scars on your chest and back. Uh, the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses say wounds between your hands. 
um, the Jerusalem's wounds on your body, the Message Bible says it's a black eye. And so that's just one example. I could show you thousands of examples where prophecy is totally destroyed, where there is massive contradiction in Hebrews chapter um, 3, verse 16, where the modern Bibles, including the New King James, say that Joshua and Caleb didn't go into the promised land. But the King James Bible says that some went in, Joshua and Caleb. Um, the, the New King James says no one went in. <laughs> and so the, just contradictions like that in Matthew chapter 1, um, where it talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the New King James and, or, and the modern versions, where the King James says it's not a genealogy of Jesus. It talks about this is the generation of Jesus or what Jesus produced, what he generated. Then it has a genealogy of Joseph not of Jesus. So the first 17 verses are totally destroyed in these new Bibles. And so um, the more I study this, the more I become alarmed and the more I realise that, that this is way more dangerous than the teachings of evolution. Uh, this, is, this is one of the, the most heretical and dangerous things that's come upon this generation. And no wonder, like I said before, we're, we're seeing so many Bart Ehrmans, we're seeing so many people. And, you know, Bart Ehrman didn't just get all his ideas in a vacuum. He got them from the Bible scholars that we're told to look at. You know, James White, Dan Wallace, they'll say, yeah, read Bruce Metzger. If you read his stuff, he has lots of heretical things. He, have, he has lots of concepts and ideas that Bart Ehrman says today, and we go, wow, that's heretical. And it's like, well, this is what Bible scholars have been saying for a long time. And I believe that the Bible societies have been overtaken by heretics, Gnostics, uh, Unitarians. Um, all you have to do is just have a cursory look at who's on some of these Bible translations, who's working on the Greek text, and you'll go, hang on, this guy's an absolute heretic. Um, and so I believe we need to go back to the King James Bible. The scholars of the King James Bible were brilliant men. Uh, God had his hand on them at that time. And I believe that the King James Bible isn't re-inspired or anything like that. It is just a good uh, translation, 100% accurate and perfect. And it is for um, us today for our correction, learning and reproof. All right. Thank you, Nick, for the opening statement. Appreciate you. All right, PJ, you're up for your 15 minute opening, man. All right. Yeah, I appreciate it. So obviously the topic of discussion, the question that we're asking is, does history show that the King James Version is without? But before we get into the specifics about the history of the King James Version or errors in the King James Version, we must first define what error means in this debate and quite frankly, any other debates with King James advocates. Because if you are a King James only, it's the tradition and tra traditional of the word error does not apply to this debate. Their definition is solely based on the comparison of their Bibles to the King James Version. And if those other Bibles do not match word for word the King James Version, then it must be put on trial. We would norm an error as wrong, wrongful action or a mistake, even if that action or mistake was intentional or not. So if we simply ask the question, has the King James Version ever contained an error, just cut and dry, we could close, this, close the book on this and be done with this debate and go home because even King James Version advocates will admit that there were errors that needed to be corrected throughout history. Have those advocates, these correction or grammar mistakes made by the original authors or overlooked by predators throughout history, they are deemed trivial because they supposedly do not alter the word of God or his overall doctrine. But spoiler alert, according to even their standards, this, this is not true. They claim these errors are merely human mistakes that were unavoidable and must be forgiven. Therefore, it's not really deemed an error. However, when we engage a King James Version advocate in this conversation and debate, we're expected to dispel and neglect the common cut and dry definition of what an error is. A person is expected to replace that definition with the concept that the King James Version is the standard and the definition of an error is solely based on making a comparison, not based on actual meaning. Therefore, the definition and concept of what an error actually is has zero relevance and is redefined altogether by those advocates solely based on the King James Version being the standard, period. 
and not based on factual information or even factual historical data. The problem with dispelling basic logic and redefining these concepts is twofold. Number one, the first, the first problem, it defies facts, logic, critical thinking, and these same advocates that would demand you to use that, that these same advocates would demand that you use when you're talking about any other topic, politics, sports, science, even other topics about religion. Yet somehow the King James Version is the only concept in debate where we are expected to ignore logic, ignore history, ignore critical thinking, and not replace it with biblical facts. The second problem, when you make the King James Version the standard of comparison, you must create goalposts that always keep moving. For example, it is a known fact, it's even admitted that the, that the King James authors and translators in words from the predecessor. So when they collaborated all those, all those texts together, they left things out and they added things in. And I'm sure that we will get into those specifics later on in, in, in this. But because, but because of that, when you dispel and neglect critical thinking and sound logic, a person can change the rules as they see fit. For example, as we established before, we have to redefine what the actual word error actually is before we ever engage within a debate or comprehend what a strong King James Version advocate believes or is advocating for. However, when you do begin to inject logic, facts, critical thinking, and unbiased reasoning, you begin to give them a whole new light. You give it context. You give it structure to define what the King James Version was and still is to our world. You start letting the history and the, and the King James Version and biblical scriptures speak to you, and you begin to appreciate the extremely difficult job a person has when they are attempting to properly translate or edit a piece of literature. The King James Version is undoubtedly a beautiful piece of work. The attention to detail, the flow of the words are unmatched. How those scholars chose to arrange words and phrases was beautifully executed. Linguistic diversity used to convey those scriptures in, in this manner sure life into the gospel of Christ. The creation of the King James Version has withstood, withstood the test of time as being the most beautiful pieces of spiritual work for the past 400 years, and rightfully so. However, magnificence, fascination, and affection towards an idea, belief, or even a piece of work does not inherently make that certain point of view fact or run by, especially that point of view is not backed by sound logic, even spiritual logic, even biblical logic. Therefore, as it relates to today's discussion, even when an individual starts to participate and engage in the definition of what an error means to a King James advocate, we find that the King James Version undoubtedly violates its own standards set by those advocates on several occasions. That when you apply their definition of what is considered perfect, preserved, without error, the King James Version did not and has not upheld that standard since that though it is a beautiful version of scriptures, the violation of the again created by those advocates proved that the King James Version is riddled with those same changes and errors that they vigorously rebuke other versions for having. Thus, whether you are defining an error by the actual definition or by the one created by King James advocates, the history does show that the King James Version has and still does contain uh, errors of many shapes. And it is only when we are able to intellectually define what an error is that we can adequately understand and appreciate the history of the King James Version and what it has meant to our world for 400 years. I know I'm a little bit earlier, but that's that's my close. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're super early, man. You have so much time left on that clock. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, fellas, for uh, those opening statements. So now we're going to go ahead and transition to our crosses at uh, to our uh, 10 minute rebuttal. Sorry. Uh, rebuttal round. So uh, starting with Mr. Nick Sayers, you're up for your 10 minute rebuttal. OK, thanks for that, PJ. Um, I just want to uh, examine what you're saying about uh, the error. Um, I, I don't necessarily um, like it. Yeah, just to have the word error redefined like that and to say that King James only us or, you know, people like myself, um, TR people or whatever, uh, that we are uh, redefining the word error. I, I don't think that that is, um, I don't think that is the case uh, for me. Uh, I have watched some King James only sort of do that, you know, uh, like it. 
I've worked on the King James Version 2016 edition. If you go to um, kjv.org.au, you can see that. And so what I've done is I've realised that, you know, the New King James doesn't cut it as a modern King James Version. Even the um, modern King James Version, um, the, uh, you know, KJV 2000, and there's a whole heap of um, TR KJV updates. And I found that um, when on examination, these had errors in them too. Um, so I'm, I'm not against updating words. I've, I've actually done that myself. And I, one of the primary reasons I did that was for people who don't speak English as a first language, like people in Papua New Guinea, people in the Philippines, Singapore, India, you know, Pakistan, and also for translators, some people they're looking at the uh, the 1611, they're looking at the um, or the say the 1900 Pure Cambridge edition. That's the one that I would go with, um, and they can get confused with some of the archaic language, and so I, I just wanted to clear that up so that when they're translating into their language that they can they don't have to do a whole bunch of homework that's already been done for them and so um yeah i'm not against uh, updating words uh and things like that but i believe that the words are accurate in in that that the words that they used in 1611 like say the word unicorn um the word unicorn people think of a you know a horse with a with a big horn and, and it's actually not the, the scientific name for rhinoceros is uh rhinoceros unicornis and so um that's the the scientific name for an indian rhinoceros and that's probably what's described in the bible so when you uh when you understand these things you see that, that it's not an error but when you look at say the um, the New King James, it talks about uh, a wild ox a, and a wild ox has two horns. And so sometimes this actually destroys prophecy as well. Uh, if you look in Genesis, uh, in the last few chapters, it talks about the unicorn there and it talks about the prophecy involving that. And so when I'm looking at an error, I'm actually, um, I'm also, I'm using logic, I'm using um you know history i'm using critical thinking i'm not just saying you know uh, any departure from the king james is just is an, is classified as an error now i believe that um the king james version you know that uh, that wasn't just created out of thin air it didn't float down in a cloud it was um years and years and years of the reformers they were going through uh the the greek text and so we have you know the work of the complutensian polyglot and then we have the work of erasmus and then we have the work of stephanus and then we have the work of tremelius and janius and then we have the work of theodore Beza, and then we have 60 guys commissioned um to work on this over a period of you know it's probably about four or five years but about seven years um you know from when it was commissioned to when it was done and these guys 60 of some of the best scholars they basically got theodore Beza's uh 1598 and he had a whole bunch of annotations as well so they didn't they didn't even have to go to all this other stuff to look for differences in Beza. they just had to look at the annotations and they basically followed Beza 99.999 you know very closely they followed Beza. there's only about 20 differences that um People like myself, uh, D.A. Waite, um, Kirk DeVitro, uh, I haven't finished my study on that, but from what I can see, it, it, there's about 20, 20 translatable differences um, between the Greek text of Theodore Beza in 1598 to the 1611. And, to the 1611. and so um, the, this is the Reformation text, and this was accepted as the standard, even Westcott and Hort recognise this. Westcott and Hort commissioned Scribner to make a Greek text underlying the King James Bible. And so uh, he, uh, Scribner basically you know, grabbed the King James Bible, he grabbed a whole bunch of Greek texts and all the rest of it, and he formulated that. And he said there was a whole bunch of differences between Beza and the King James. He said there was about 190. But when you go through them, most of them are just phonetic. Um, and uh, some of them are to do with the Latinization of English. And some words he said come from the Latin Vulgate. But they're just, uh, it's just Latin that's entered into the English um, language. Like, say, Beazel Bub is the Latin word for saying the Greek Beazel Baal. 
but we just say Beelzebub in English. And that was one of the, um, the translator's rules. Uh, the 1611 guys, they were basically just to follow uh, the standardized names. Yeah, they were to call Paul, Paul, not Paulos. But then when you read Timothy, uh, it says Timotheos because Shakespeare had a play at that time. Timotheos was a popular name as well. So Timothy and Timotheos are used in the King James Bible. And so, um, you know, Scribner, he, he went a bit overboard. He had 190 changes. And a lot of those were actually to do with headings. You know, the, um, the gospel according to St. Matthew. You know, does, it have, does it have saint in it? Or, and so a lot of the headings are included in the 190. A lot of just names, uh, probably about a third of them are just names. And so um, this, So basically uh, what Edward Hill said is the King James is its unique form of Textus Receptus. So the, the King James translators, they were even more skilled than Beza. Uh, Lancelot Andrews, um, John Boyce, uh, Henry Seville, these guys were legends. And so these guys, they could, any one of them could have produced their own Greek text and it would have been accepted throughout Europe and throughout England. And, um, but they didn't. They produced an English text. And so had they done a parallel Greek text, there would be no King James only movement. There would just be like, oh, they just followed that one. But because they did their final work in English, and they didn't do a Greek parallel. Yeah, Scribner did it like 250 years later. Um, yeah, that people are like, oh, the King James, you know, oh, people sort of worship an English Bible. No, it's just because it, all the scholarship was focused on the English language at that time, and they just did an English version. And so it's the Texas Receptus in English. That's all it is. And so, um, but but just going back to the King James only, you know, the definition of error, um, I can't see how a genealogical list in the Old Testament, in the new versions, doesn't match up with a genealogical list in the New Testament. To me, that's just a logical error. I mean, a, a Muslim would come along and say, that's an error. A, a Je Jehovah's Witnesses would say that. As Catholic would say that. Anyone would, it, who, who would study logic um, and fallacies and things like that, they would look at that and say, it's just an error. Um, if... Uh, you know, historical errors. I mean, if we're going to have Jesus going from one place to another, um, like say, for example, <clears throat> actually, I can't find that example. Oh, here we are in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Um, no, actually, that's the wrong example. But in new versions, we have Jesus going to the wrong place. Uh, to me, that's just a, an error. It's just a... Um, it, it doesn't matter. If, it, it's not a King James. Uh, I mean, many times what you'll find is the King James Version actually agrees with all the Reformation Bibles. So you have Tinder, you'll have um, your Kramer Bible, you have the Great Bible, you have the Bishop's Bible, you have the Geneva Bible, you have all these Bibles, and they're pretty much in agreement. And uh, then you have the new versions come along, which say something completely different. Um, I, I don't think it's a King James redefinition of error. I think it's just a, a, there's logic involved in this. And part of translational work is logic. Part of that is when we see solecisms in the Greek, solecism is just a, a mistake in the Greek, uh, we understand that there's probably something wrong there. So in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we see in the modern version, say God, uh, say, say he appeared in a body where the King James says um, uh, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, in the Greek, that is actually one of the greatest grammatical blunders in the critical text. And we also see that in 1 John 5, 7, we see a massive solecism there where um, the the genders don't match up. And so we see a massive mistake. And it's never talked about. It's always talked about, oh, the majority text has this. And, and critical text guys don't care about the majority text. Um, but on this one, they do, you know. And, and who's to say, you know, the Greek empire, they had their own issues, just like the the uh, the Latin empire did as well. And so uh, anyway, I think I'm, I'm done there. My time's over. But, um, yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nick Sayers. All right, PJ, you're up for your 10-minute rebuttal. Okay. Well, I appreciate what I, I can appreciate what Nick is saying there, but 
What, what, what disturbs me the most about when we have this conversation is we, we tend to think that history happens in a vacuum. We, we, if those of us who have had you know, discussions online, we've seen the chart, the, the Byzantine text is over here and the Alexandrian text is over here and you got lines and you got straight figures and it all just happened the way it was. And we tend to think of history being simple, that they were more that they just automatically knew we were wrong. And I think of history, even more modern history, we tend to glorify those people and think think they just because their world wasn't so complicated that somehow they just knew what right and wrong was. But that wasn't always the case. And that's exactly what we saw happening with the King James Version in its conception. Essentially, what we had when the King James Version was being conceived is we had a conflict within the Church of England. Now, the Church of England <clears throat> undoubtedly was more than just one building, one one congregational body, but the 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 Church of England was split mainly between the Puritans and, and the bishops. And what ended up happening is the campaign called in 1604, and pretty much the Puritans laid out what they wanted. They laid out some things that they were requesting from the bishops and from the king. So essentially what we had is we had just like you go on Sunday and you got a church split down the middle on, on doctrine. Now imagine in 2020, if, if a church was split down in doctrine and the proposed solution to bridge that church together was, was to create a new Bible. They were a King James Bible believing church, but they created a whole new Bible. And that was their solution to the problem. 99.9% .9 of all King James advocates would have a problem with that, especially if that Bible was commissioned by the government. And then, you know, I got it up on my screen right now. I, I'm looking at 15 rules that King James instituted through Richard ba Bancroft that that the, the the translators and the scholars had to abide by. Now, let me tell you something. If it was inspired, if it was directly imperfect, and it was perfect, perfectly God's word, and He promised that perfection, why do we need rules? Why 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 need rules? There should be only one rule: inspiration, God's touch. But in fact, in rule number three, we're actually seeing where the king told his scholars that they must keep and change words if they don't meet the ecclesiastical words that have always been used. For example, if you see the word uh, congregation, you change it to church. And there's many other examples of that. So I have a problem. You know, if I'm a King James advocate, I'm supposed to be having a problem with that because Revelation 22:19 tells me don't add or remove words. Don't change the words. So how can I logically believe that something is the most preserved and the most most a, uh, accurate uh, form of literature, but yet I'm looking right here and I'm looking at a rule where the king got to say, no, we're changing it to this and quoted no spiritual guidance for doing so. So we have problems with motive. We also have some problems where we're being told specifically change words. And I don't know, I, I, I grew up in a King James only household. I come from that background, very strict. And I know that if, if, if we would have heard that, and, and obviously Nick has referred to it as well, that if we hear of a committee or if we hear of a government trying to create scriptures and they're telling their, their people to change words to meet the old ecclesiastical words. And the old ecclesiastical me means just what they've always used within the church. And you gotta remember something, the, the, the English government and the church were one. The king ruled it all. So imagine if even our president, we have a, we have here in the United States, we, we have a, 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 a law of separation of church and state. Obviously we're in 2020, some of that's getting, getting violated. That is what it is, but we have a separation of church and state. So I know my King James advocates would have a huge problem if the government came down, even if it was Donald Trump, even even your most conservative person, political person, if if that man had come out with a new Bible and it was known that he told his scholars, that he told those people that were on that committee to change words, there would be a huge problem. And the fact remains is that that's just a small glimpse into it. This is not including the controversies that have followed. People who are familiar with con with with the King James versions knows the he and she controversy, the publication controversies, the the things that had to be changed just to fit certain words in the, the, the type script that they had to for the printers. I mean, God said he's not the author of confusion, but why is there still so much confusion over this topic? 
And that's why I went back to my first argument that it's really not about an error because an error is an error. It's cut and dry. But and, and, and it's not just grammatical errors. We, we see situations where whole phrases are removed from its predecessors in the King James and its predecessors. We see situations where those grammatical errors actually changes a lot of things. And they're the same changes that these people rebuke the other, the other Bibles for doing. So why is it okay in the ecosystem of the King James Version to make all these changes and these significant or, or insignificant, trivial, whatever you want to call it, don't matter what, what adjective you want to add on front of that, big, small, doesn't matter. Why is it okay? I'm told not to remove, add or remove words, but yet it seems like the goalpost move when, when, it, when it's the King James Version. So that's my rebuttal. I, I just don't get it. All right, thank you both for those rebuttals. Now we're going to go ahead and transition to our um, uh, our cross examination portion of this debate. Let me pull this time off here real quick. It's a distraction. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go to our rebuttal round of this debate. And um, you guys, once again, it's going to be a forty minute rebuttal round. Both both of you parties that have two ten minute opportunities to ask questions. Uh, please make sure that you are asking those questions. Let's make sure that. We respect that person's time for question asking. All right. Let's make sure we respect that time and not respond with another question. Okay. With that said, Mr. Nick, you are up for your first 10 minute cross examination of PJ. Okay, PJ. Um, can I just ask you um, so, which uh, Bible or which um, whether it's English or whatever language or which Greek text or Hebrew text, uh, would you say is the words of God today? Fairly, logically, and critically, I can't answer that question. You know why I can't answer that question? It's because I don't have, I don't have those originals. I don't know what the originals are. Even Jesus, when he was reading, reading in Luke, he read and what was there are two separate different things. To me, as being a logical human being, even a spiritual human being, I have to be very careful. This is supposed to be God's word, and we're supposed to be revering it as God's word, but we're just freely making excuses for it. So I can't answer that question. Okay, so if I was, say, a Muslim, and I met you on the street, and I said, um, I, I want to read your Bible, I want to, I want to convert to Christianity, which, where would you direct him to find the words of God that Jesus said, my heaven and earth will pass away, but my words won't pass away. Um, or, you know, he said, don't add or subtract to the words of God and things like that. You know, where, where would these words be found? I personally uh, enjoy, part, if, you, if we're talking about what I feel, I personally serve as, I like to use the, the, the Jewish translated Bible. Um, it's mainly Old Testament text, but um, and it does have some New Testament. But I, I thoroughly enjoy the the uh, Jewish International Version. Okay, and so um, which uh, which rules uh, for the um, King James translators do you think um, you know poison the well sort of thing in in the King James? Um, just just getting on to what you were saying in your rebuttal there. Um, so out of the, the 15 rules for translators, which which one do you, th or which ones do you think, um, you know, shouldn't be abided by? And for what reason? Well, I, I mean, I, when I look at this list and I'm looking at it right now, it, it's hard to really pinpoint that because I'm seeing a lot of instances where I'm not seeing an inspiration from God. I'm not seeing the king telling his people to, to look towards God. I'm seeing a lot of things talking about copy from the bishop's Bible. Rule number three, change the word from from church to congregation or, or keep it if, it if it's necessary. I'm seeing uh, refer to the, to, uh, you know, um, I'm looking at it right now, propriety of the place, the analogy of faith. All these things are referring to man-made structured environments and, and rules that ironically came from the Roman Catholics. Um, but at the same time, I'm not seeing anything that says follow God, follow his word. I'm seeing a lot of very 
you know, kind of kind of royal and kind of things that have already been established. That was the standard. So I can't really pin, pinpoint, to be quite honest, I'm looking at this list. I'm uncomfortable. If I had a committee that was creating the Bible and I was reading what I'm reading, and it's all based on man-made structures, not God, not godly things that are in his book, but man-made structures or man-made standards, that's a problem. Okay. Um, so what, which uh, committee, which Bible committee do you think has done it correctly? You're talking about the specific, the breakdowns of who worked on what? Is that is that what you're referring to? Or, um, like, say, in any, like, like, if the King James guys, they didn't get it right, you know, uh, according to you. Um, so, you know, did Westcott and Hort get it right? Or the, you know, the Nestle Islands, uh, say, you know, with my, Carlo Martini, the Jesuit guy, and um, Bruce Metzger and... and um, Kurt Aylin, did they get it correct or are, are they using a correct methodology, a biblical methodology, uh, it, or has anyone done it correctly? Obviously, you know, and I would stand with you on, on the whole fact that these other Bibles do, do have errors as well. I'll, I'll stand with you on that one, but so does the King James Version. So saying that they got it right, obviously they didn't because we have so many variations. And ironically, you know, I talked about that chart earlier. I talked about the, the linearness of that chart and, it, and it's great for visual and, and I get why it's made, but the same alterations and, 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 and things that are so vehemently rebuked by the Alexandrian line, it's the same things that we, are, we see happening on the Byzantine line as well. It, 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 it kind of gets a little trivial. King James advocates like to be a little bit trivial about it and don't like to acknowledge it as much. But we're seeing the same as that changing of words and phrases and rearranging. In fact, it's on record that the that the scholars of the King James rearrange just to make it sound more majestic or, or 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 significant or royal, whatever word you want to use there. So going back to your question, obviously they didn't, and I'll stand with you to say that they didn't. But neither did the King James version. Okay, so so pretty much what you're saying is no one has gotten gotten it right. Again, I refer to what I answered to before. We don't have the originals. It is irresponsible for anybody looking at any document that's been passed over time and to say, without having the original and saying, I got it right. I, I got it right and I've had it right this whole time when we don't know. It's just plain and simple. There's no, there's no complicated controversy. We simply don't know at the end of the day. And for us to make definitive statements is, is borderline blasphemous because you and me both, we understand John 1.1. 1, 1. We're supposed to believe that this is God's word, the preservation at least of his word. Shouldn't we take a little bit more reverence and slow down a little bit and stop thinking that we need to have definitive answers and absolute slow down and take more reverence and say, I don't have the originals. I don't even know who would have had the originals. So, so why, do, why am I supposed to take responsibility for knowing in 2020, thousands of years later? Um, so do you believe in the preservation of scripture? Yes. Okay. Um, so do you believe it's the words themselves have been preserved? Define what you mean by words themselves. Um, so the Bible says that the words uh, are inspired um, as when when the men wrote them, uh, they became inspired. Uh, God, God breathed, uh, some people would say. Um, and so those words, um, can we find those words today or do you, you think that they're, we can't find the words that, that have been penned? like, or a representative or a copy of those words? I think, I think accumulation of all of what we have. Sure. There, and again, I'll stand with you. There's some bad, there's some bad Bibles out there. Don't get me wrong. Not every Bible is, is, is totally right. We, we, we can name, both of us can name that. So it's not about that. But to answer your question, I believe that accumulation of everything that we do have, allows us to get a glimpse into what the what the message is. Translation and understanding 
God's word isn't about getting every single word right. It's about getting an idea right. That's how people translate. You can go to a translator, listen to somebody translating, and if you know both sides of the conversation, you know there's going to be a little bit, you know, change in words. But what we are seeing with the King James Version is we're not just seeing a few changes in words. We're seeing some dramatic changes that are being rebuked on the other side when the other people do it. So it's accumulation, and it goes back to the preface of the King James Version in 1611. The scholars themselves said that even the meanest translation is the word God and does their heels and instituted that it was very much adequate and critical that people study all Bibles so that they can understand what truly it meant to say. Yeah, I would disagree with that, um, but I'll I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and so, what what would you consider um, an error to be in the King James Bible? Like where you know, if someone was to come up and say, you know, show me a blatant error in the King James Bible, prove it wrong, what would be your first go to place? Well, uh, we can we can go with many, and 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 I don't mind. I have a list here. If, if you want me to single out one that I was going to use later, I can do that. Um, let me just go through a list here. Okay, so here here's a. I'm a big history person, so I'm going to use this as an example um, because I I like history and I, and there's a lot of history in the Bible as well and in any scripture. But if you look at Second Kings twenty three verses twenty nine through thirty, it's also in Second Chronicles. <clears throat> excuse me, Second Chronicles thirty five verses twenty through twenty five. What is now known even outside the Bible as the Battle of Megiddo. And what that battle entailed was, and, and I know that empires, for, for, for some, empires and who was ruling what and people who just read their Bible casually, you know, just to get <clears throat> the, the, the spiritualness out of it, sometimes don't really pay attention to this. But what ended up happening is the Assyrian Empire was failing and the Babylonian Empire was starting to wave in, on in. Well, if anybody knows their Bible, they'll know that the Assyrian Empire was never able to conquer the land of Judea. So the Assyrian Empire that was failing called on the Egyptians to help them and ally them in the battle. And so inevitably, if you know geography, the Egyptians have to have to go through Judea to be able to to help because they're they're in Syria, not Assyria, but they're in Syria and they have to walk on through. Well, Second Kings 23 through 29, uh, 29 to 30 depicts that the Judeans, the Judean army, met their forces and Josiah was was killed during this battle. But the King James Bible says that the Egyptians went against the Assyrians. They they marched up through to go against the Assyrians and every other account of this situation contradicts that because the Egyptians factually, historically, and actually were pro-Assyrian forces, were part of that pro forces and were meeting the Babylonians in battle, uh, later later on in the battle of, I'm going to murder this name, but Carchemish, Kar I believe is how you pronounce it, four years later. And you saw the Assyrians and, and the Egyptians joining forces. They got decimated by the Babylonians, but they actually joined forces after that, that delay with the Judeans, and they fought the Babylonians and got destroyed, and the Babylonians were obviously able to come in, and we, we kind of know the story about that. So that is a blatant error because... Even even Babylonian resources, even historical Hebrew resources, say that the Egyptians and the Assyrians were were together. But the King James version says that the Egyptians went to go against the Assyrians. All right, that's time. All right, PJ, it is your turn for a ten minute cross examination of Nick Sayers. Okay, let me get to my. I did have some questions lined up here, so bear with me. All right. My, my first question for you, Nick, is um, it very, very uh, this would probably be very simple for somebody like yourself um, who has been many times. Is Revelation 22, 19 relevant to rebuking any changes made to the word of God? Uh, yes, I guess that depends on how you define a change. Um, and uh, I think words that are synonyms um, being changed uh, are that's not a, a change. I believe that 
Um, when we look at the original Hebrew, the Aramaic and the Greek, as long as we are bringing those words across in an understandable way and, and an, in an honest way, um, I believe that we won't violate those uh, principles. Okay. Um, so my next question is, is, you know, we're, we were getting obviously very specific about changes in error, what is considered an error. And I proposed that idea in my open statement. So, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, how big of an alteration of scriptures does it need to be before you would consider it unacceptable? And, and I know there's not supposed to be follow-ups, but is it, is it a total change in doctrine as far as that verse? Is it a letter or a phrase, uh, uh, what is that to you? What What is deemed unacceptable when it comes to that? Uh, well, I think one of the things is we usually hear, you know, as long as no cardinal doctrine is, is destroyed. But, um, I mean, the cardinal doctrines of Christianity, you could probably write them down on an A4 sheet of paper. You know what I mean? It's like, well, we believe in the Trinity. We believe Jesus is God. We believe in, you know, um, you know, we could just fit that on an A4 sheet of paper and say they're the cardinal doctrines. And so what we're sort of saying is we can get rid of all the rest of the Bible as long as we've got the cardinal doctrines right. And I believe it's a, it's a wrong way of looking at the words of God. I believe that every word of God is pure and every word of God is very important. And just to change uh, one word, um, we know with the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. Just that one little A in the small G there just changes it. And most Christians physically shudder when they, they hear that. And they're like, oh, that's terrible. But I believe that most modern Bibles do that over and over. And over. every chapter that I see in modern Bibles has errors like that in it. And um, and so I think everything is important in the Bible, um, and I believe that uh, any type of change, any type of uh, you know, addition, change, or um, omission uh, should be um, should be avoided. Okay. So so just to clarify, this isn't actually a question, but just to clarify. It's based on if it changes the cardinal doctrine of it is basically what you're saying. Uh, not the cardinal doctrine, just even the words, even if it has really not much to do with the cardinal doctrine. So what I'm what I'm saying is, I guess most modern um, version supporters they say, oh, you know, the NIV doesn't change any cardinal doctrine. You know, as long as you can find the Trinity in there and as long as you can find the deity of Christ, then it's a good Bible sort of thing where that what I'm saying is you, you could write that out on an A4 sheet of paper, you know, and delete the rest of the Bible and still have the cardinal doctrines there, you know, sort of thing. I believe that there is so much change in the modern Bibles. Um, like you, you try and do a, a study on fasting, um, if you do it in the King James, you, you'll get a good understanding of what fasting is. If you do it in the modern Bibles, you'll be struggling to even find the doctrine of fasting in the modern Bibles. It's almost gone. And there's just a few scanty little crumbs of information. But the King James has fasting all the way through it. You know, this kind comes not out by prayer and fasting. And there's so many so many other things that are deleted and changed and you know the last 12 verses a month the woman caught in adultery these are 12 verses each just deleted so there's about 253 verses that someone like james white uh, cast doubt over um that uh, are found in the king james in the reformation bibles that, that are used in um you know people will go to the westminster confession of faith or the baptist confession and, and they quote many of these verses that are deleted now. Uh, and for, for me, um, if I was a Muslim, I'd be just be looking at this Christian religion and going, they don't even have these verses anymore. What's This is ridiculous, you know. And so um, that's what I would be doing. And that's what I used to do when I was a non-Christian. Marlon, how much time do I have uh, for a question? Uh, yeah, about four and a half minutes left. Okay. So I want to I want to ask another question that, to lean off of that. So so it's kind of interesting that you you brought up the new world and that example. Uh, I want to I don't know what you have in front of you, but you know if you look at Jeremiah forty nine one and you look at Jeremiah forty nine one in the sixteen eleven versus it in the seventeen sixty nine edition, we're seeing exactly as you just pointed out 
where something of, of doctrine was taken out. And I'll, I'll read the verse for you. I have it right here in front of me. So, um, so in the in the the way it's written now in the King James Version, concerning the Ammonites, thus saith the Lord: Hath Israel no sons? Hath he no heir? Why doth their king inherit Gad, and his people dwell in his cities? But the problem with that is, is that in the sixteen edition, in the sixteen eleven edition, it says, concerning the Ammonites, thus saith the Lord: Hath Israel no sons? Hath he no heir? Why doth their king inherit God? And his people dwell in the cities. So I find it find it interesting. And there's a question at the end of this. I apologize. Um, I find it very interesting that you brought out that example about the new world new world situation. But I'm seeing a blatant a blatant God is taken out of Jeremiah 40, 49 one. So so how do we justify that? Okay, so I'm just trying to find that. Okay, I just found it. Okay, so. Um, I actually don't have the that with the um, 1611 in front of me because um, I'm trying to save my bandwidth for the for the video so it doesn't jump and so I've, I've turned it off on my other laptop. But um, <laughs> usually, what I find with these situations is it, it's, it usually comes down to uh, print errors and uh, many times what what you see in the 1611 with any document of that era you would have a massive amount of print errors. The Bible is just a huge book. And so what you would see is, you know, the 1611 would say something and then, you know, there was a 16, I think it was 38 uh, update and then it went through to the uh, 1762 and then the Blaney edition. And then, um, so that's why I, I recommend people follow the uh, 1900 pure Cambridge edition where all these, um, you know, print errors and um, errors, uh, and I don't think a print error is necessarily an error in the Bible. Um, if if the cook may make something that's a hundred percent perfect, and the waiter on the way out to serve it, you know, bumps into the door or something and spills a bit of the drink and makes the food a bit crooked and serves it to you, that doesn't mean it's the cook's fault. We can easily find what the words. Uh, are and we can look at the text of Beza that underlies the King James. We can look at uh, other editions. We can look at the Bishop's Bible, the 1602 edition that they uh, reference off, and we can look at the translators' notes. Um, many of them were lost in the Great Fire of London, unfortunately. But we can also just uh, look at logic and things like that. And so many times. Um, and I know I can't answer this one specifically, but many times that's that's the answer for those situations. Okay. I'll, I'll yield time on that, Marlon. To Florida State, you're conceding your time. All right, Nick, you're up for your five minute, final 10 minute cross examination of PJ. Okay, so, um, So what would be your problem with having the word um, you know, congregation not always being used as church? What, why would that be an issue, say, with the rules for translation? Because I have a problem with a king who didn't cite spiritual guidance and given, handing down rules. You also have to understand the context of why these rules were handed down. Not only was the church being split, <clears throat> excuse me, but the church was being split for multiple reasons. The church was losing power during that time. The printing press was all the rage and people were starting to read. People who weren't normally starting to read the Bible were starting to read it in the church and the government because they were all intertwined during that time. Started losing power over the people. So they wanted, and, and the Bible predominantly, uh, for the most part, at least during services, was read to the people. So you think about it, you're losing power. Why wouldn't you want to try to institute the word church? It's a subtle change, but you think about those subtle changes really play a huge factor. And if it's there, if, if people see the word church there, they're going to stop there and go, I need to give my, my, my devotion to the church. It's exactly, you know, uh, King James advocates are very strong about about rebuking Catholicism, but that's exactly what Catholicism has been doing for centuries. So I find it highly ironic that we 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 kind of scoff off all oh, they they just they just you know we need we we don't need the word congregation we need to change it to church. 
But yet when other people do the same changes, we're all of a sudden fully aware and fully, I guess the word now in 2020 is woke, we're woke to the idea that, oh my God, they, they, it was a conspiracy. Yeah, it's always a conspiracy when it, when it happens over there, but when it happens to us, it's just clear, clear as day. So yeah, my answer to your question is it's not so much whether the word should or should not be there. It's the fact that the, the king didn't allow the scholars to do their job in their rules before they even got started. So how do I know that the, the, you know, the word church was supposed to be there? If I'm living in England during that time, how do I know that that word church is supposed to be there or congregation? I'm just going with what I'm hearing or what it's given or what's being printed or whatever the case may be. So it's not so much the word itself, <coughs> excuse me, the word itself, it's the fact that that word, know whether that word should have been there or not, not just because the kiss doesn't necessarily mean that that's inherently tr true. Okay, so do you, do you find um, faults? Do you think there's something wrong with the word church? If it's not supposed to adequately be there. Now, I'll, I'll yield ground and say, I'm not an expert in Greek or Hebrew. But I have a, once again, I have a problem with somebody who didn't even let the scholars just do what they needed to do, which was translate or, or collaborate to do their job. So it's not about the word. It's about we're instituting rules where they don't need to be. You wouldn't accept that if, you, if your president did that or your ruler or a king over there or a king over here, if you knew that he was instituting that, hey, it says this here, but every time you see it, you need to change it. We would, King James advocates would be blowing, blowing so much smoke over that. So why is it acceptable for a king to do it in 1611, but in 2020, it would be unacceptable and people would, King James advocates would be raising a fuss over it in their churches. Okay, so do you um, do you think that King James was a um, a homosexual or like um, like many people? I, I haven't. I, I, I don't subscribe. I don't subscribe to that. I know there's a lot of things okay. that go around when you when you're on social media that that's irrelevant to me. To be quite honest, if he was, he was. If he wasn't, he wasn't. Even if he was, you know. What can you say? We still got the we still have the Bible in front of us, so it's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. Okay, and so what do you see as the future? Um, do you think that um, like textual criticism will find uh, a a definitive Bible? Like you're saying, like all the Bibles, including the King James, has errors. Do you think that we will, yeah, you know, with the CBGM or, or with uh, textual criticism, just continuing? continuing on or the finding of new manuscripts, do you think that we will be able to produce a Bible and say, well, this is, you know, akin to what we have in the originals? Well, I can't predict the future. Uh, you know, and the Bible is very clear about trying to do so and trying to find signs and trying to, trying to figure out what God's going to do. But, you know, that you know, if, if it's not so much whether we're so wrapped up in wanting to define an, an absolute that we have to have this perfect, but maybe preservation isn't about one. Maybe preservation is about studying thyself to, to show approved. Isn't that what the Bible says? Who, who said it had to be one Bible? Who said it had to be one book in 1611? My, uh, no Bible I've ever read said that in 1611, I'm going to drop this Bible on you and it's, it's going to be the perf most perfect thing you've ever written. It just says it's pre preservation. And if this word will be forever settled in heaven, and it mentions nothing about earth. So I don't know what the future holds. I think that if we critically look at these books and we are able to identify the overall message, the message is, is the crucifixion. The message is going to heaven, that he died on the cross for our sins. That's the point. So surely if a Bible doesn't have that, then there's something wrong. So I don't know what the future holds, but I do know that if we use critical thinking, we can get closer to that. Okay, so when a, when a Bible um, has, like, contradicts um, itself, um, what, what would you call that, you know, um, 
in a sense where you, you, you sort of, I guess in a way it's pretty um, hard to nail down exactly where you're coming from because you're not sort of standing behind any Greek text, really. You sort of mentioned this Hebrew Bible. Um, you're not really standing behind all the modern versions. You're saying they're all filled with error. It doesn't really fill me with much confidence that we can find the word of God. You know, if I was to say, where are the words of God? And you sort of say, well, the, the, there's errors sort of everywhere. It's like um, it's like saying there's there's flies all in, Is in my the truth? food. Is that not the truth? Um, well, I guess that's why, um, you know, with the King James, I'm saying that, you know, there are no errors in the King James. Um, I, I believe that the modern versions, yes, do have errors, but I, I can't, um, I can't see where there's, um, where there's any errors in the, in the King James. Like I know you've pointed so out. When you, um, when you read, my, when you read Luke, when you read Luke 4, 18 and 19, and it's Jesus reading Isaiah, what we know now know as Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and you hold them two together, and it's not the same. And it's not the same by a couple of words, you know, a couple of letters here and there. It's almost the same, same message. It, it, it conveys the same message, but it's totally different. So, so what is the explanation? You're telling me there's no errors, but Jesus Christ himself read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and far as the King James Version, he read something totally different than it was in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. So either the King James Version got it wrong, either the variant that Jesus that Jesus had was was changed, or the author of Luke misquoted altogether, and, and no telling what, what's been done since then, or, and this, this is highly unlikely, I don't stand by point number four, or Jesus just simply lied and misquoted himself. Obviously, we know that Jesus is perfect and he would need to do that. But it still raises a point. How can I? You're telling me <coughs> that I need to have a perfect and preserved word, but yet the when when there's two scriptures that are supposed to be mirrored together, they don't even match up. So why is it okay in the ecosystem of the King James Version for it to be okay, but when somebody over here in the ESV, the RSV, whatever whatever lettering you you want to throw out there, it's all of a sudden wrong or bad. It's of Satan and and, and everything else. Yeah, I guess I'm not really sure if I'm able to allowed to answer your question, but I'll just answer that one. Um, in a sense, where uh, I would say that um, Jesus read the whole chapter, and Luke was just highlighting some of the. Points. We don't know um, that, but that's the thing. We don't know that. That's that's human speculation. You're inserting your own thought even into your own Bible. We don't know that. We only know that he read what we now know as ver verses one and, and the beginning part. So why, why if you're going to insert something that's not in the Bible, why should I believe you to tell me that you had the perfect, but yet you're inserting things that aren't even in the Bible? Um, but this is throughout all the Bibles. Like, um, I guess what you, you're sort of entering into. A bit but we're not defending other Bibles. We're defending the King James Version. That's what we're talking about. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, time. That's yeah. That's time right there. All right, PJ, you're up for your final ten minute cross examination, of Nick. All right. Let me get back to my questions. Um, bear with me a second. So, so I've I've alluded to this question uh, quite a few times. So we we have a situation. We we for all cases we had. The, the English church split on doctrine, and that's why the Hampton Court Conference even happened. It was it was a, trying to bring together two sides uh, of of this church and try to make men's. And there was proposals made, and one of those proposals, actually number three out of four, uh, proposal was this new Bible translation. So my my question is is if we virtually have a split in the church, and one of the solutions to bring that split together uh, was a proposal of a Bible. Would you support su support the same morality of that happening in 2020, where you got a King James only church, they're split in doctrine, and then their proposal to merge that that church is proposing a new Bible? Would you support something of that nature, and it be and it be overlooked by our government or your government rather? Okay, I think comparing the governments of today to uh, kingdoms of that era um, is even today, is like comparing even today. Chalk and cheese. I think um, 
like because I, I I wouldn't say that you know I'm I'm not a Republican Democrat supporter you know I'm more libertarian sort of thing but when I look at say the life of King James he was a brilliant scholar um, he knew many languages uh, he grew up in the Presbyterian Church they were trying to kill him um, pretty much all his life his mother was a staunch Catholic and he basically rejected her. And he rejected Catholicism. He said he was not a Catholic. He said he rejected the Apocrypha. Um, he said he's not a papist, so he doesn't you know, believe that it's the word of God and all this stuff. And so um, when you look at his rules, they're probably not just his ideas. They're probably all his advisors because his advisors were, you know, people like Lancelot Andrews. Um, you know, he had um, you know, Bancroft and a whole bunch of other guys around him and they've discuss these issues and so there's a whole bunch of english history that goes um that goes from tyndale all the way through to the 1611 so say with the word church um tyndale he used the word congregation or assembly and he because the church at his time was thoroughly roman catholic and thoroughly corrupt but when you come to the time after elizabeth you've got lots of different flavored churches you've got puritans you've got all sorts of things and so um, the church isn't corrupt anymore. It's not like it's not the whore of Babylon anymore. It's you know it's got problems, and even King James in the uh, millinery um, petition um, conversation, he at Hampton Court, he actually said you know he likened the church to having the pox, and so he said it's got problems. But he was just fresh from Scotland. He was fresh from Presbyterianism, and so he's come in this situation, and they've got Bibles. They have mistakes in them. the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible. If you just look at, say, Matthew chapter one, um, they add a guy called Jacob in their genealogy. It's not in the King James and all the modern versions reject this guy. And that's there's mistakes like that in these Bibles. That's what they were bringing up. So can you can you fix this? Can you can you do this? So it actually wasn't just like King James just went. I'm, I'm just going to create a Bible. It was uh, the millinery petition was a thousand. Uh, pastors who uh, they wrote to the king about a whole bunch of issues and uh, one of the things that was brought up was Bible translation and can we have an accurate Bible translation without notes and things like that so it's just the Bible we, we you know Geneva uh, was good while there was all this rebellion and sedition and all sorts of things happening but now it's sort of a peace more peaceful times we, we don't need all these notes and you know all the rest of it and so uh, that the king just went, yeah, cool, we'll do that. And so um, his rules, um, when you look at, say, Tyndale, he had um, congregation because church to that generation was an evil thing. But the church had become a good thing to the generation of, um, of you know, Elizabeth and King James. And so they used church for all the believers uh, with Ecclesia and they used assembly when it was... Uh, the Jews, and they used congregation when it was mixed between believers and Jews. So the King James is very specific in how they did that. And I can't see that that's a Catholic thing or that that um, is a mistake in the, in the King James. I think it's a very good rule. I think it, it smoothed out a lot of problems that were happening in Bible translations up until 1611. So you would endorse that that happened in 2020? Apples to apples, you would endorse that happening in 2020. Don't, don't, don't worry about the extraordinary a, details. It's just, just the optic of a king overseeing in a, a, a Bible translation as a way to bring the church together. You would endorse that. Well, it just depends. See, we already have good Bibles here in the English-speaking world. But just say I was to go to a place like I've been to Bougainville, that's going to become the youngest nation in the world. And so... Um, they're voting on a president. I've met many of the candidates for presidency there. I've preached a lot there. And so if they were to produce a Bible, and many of them are Bible-believing Christians, they're very strong Christians, if they were to produce a Bible and they, and he was, you know, the president was to write out a bunch of rules, knowing that that guy is actually Christian and knowing that there are faithful people underneath him translating, I would say no problems. But if you, you're comparing you know, Trump and Clintons, and to me, these guys are sort of like, um, you know, they're, they're and, sort of, and the, the who's, who's the guy is the yeah. authority. 
Uh, sorry, what was that? Oh, sorry. Uh, what I was saying is it, it's not about who's who's at the top. It, it, it's about governmental authority. You can put a king of Jordan. You could you could substitute anybody. Would you not raise a fuss if you knew that this Bible was going to be made just because it was proposed to, to merge a church together and the government was going to oversee it? Just simply put, would, would, yeah. and, and, and it was supposed to compete with the King James Version for, for all case and purposes or any other version for that matter. Would you support that? Would you be upset? I don't think that it was made just because there was a split. I believe it was made on the- It was proposed um, during the Hampton Court Conference. It was proposed by the Puritans. I'm escaping on the gentleman's mm. name. It was proposed to the king. It's in writing. It's on their, It's on the, the, the archive website where they wrote it out. Yeah. And it was proposed by the Puritan. And it was done during a conference where they were trying to figure out how they were going to merge the two sides together because they couldn't agree on anything hardly. At least when you read it, it seems like it. They probably agreed on a whole lot more than because history doesn't happen in a vacuum. But it wasn't even proposed by King James. But yet we're supposed to just be okay with it just because it happened in 1611. But if we're if the optics were in 2020 raising a fuss. I know every King James Version in church that I know would be raising the fuss. Okay, like say for example, there are places where they don't have a perfect Bible, you know, they're, they're, and um, if I was to um, see, say a leader say, look, we, we want to make this Bible you know, perfect. We want to iron out all the problems. And he got 60 of the best scholars of that day and said, you know, here's some basic guidelines. I, I don't, I don't see any problem with that. I, I don't, I don't see, I, I think there's many other reasons why the King James was written. I think King James knew there was mistakes in the Geneva and in the bishops. Um, and so did all the people at his conference. And so this is, they all knew that the, the Bible, it was good. And in the in the introduction to the King James Bible, they said, you know, there's been many good Bibles, but we want to make one principal Bible. You know, we want to iron out just these little errors and things like that and make a, make a, a, a perfect edition. And so um, I, I, don't, I don't see that it was just made because there was a church split. And in a sense of bringing it to 2020, you know, we're living in a day where, um, you know, politics is... is Pretty much insane like and but there would have been people back then i mean even um if you look at uh, henry the eighth you know he just basically grabbed tyndales and said look we'll use that and we call it the great bible and and all the rest of it but um god can still move through that and use that you know and um most of the editions english editions most of the european editions were commissioned by kings and by rulers and so i, I don't think it's a, a such a strange concept Okay. All right. How much time do I have left, Marlon? You have about 25 seconds. Okay. I'll yield that. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, guys. Great cross-examination. So now we're going to transition to our closing statements. Uh, then we'll follow it up with a Q&A. So audience, once again, if you got questions, get them in. We have some already, but get them in so we can jog these guys minds and see how they respond to these questions all right all right uh nick you're up first for your 10 minute closing okay so the king james version was the culmination of all the knowledge of that era and so what we see the translators of that time say henry seville he had um he translated the complete works of Chrysostom, which is uh, yeah, eight massive, like phone book size volumes. It was absolutely massive. And so Chrysostom was one of the Greek fathers. He wrote in uh, Greek. And so that was translated. And so he used Lancelot Andrews. He used John Boyce. These are all King James translators. These guys knew Greek. They knew Latin. Lancelot Andrews spoke 21 languages. He spoke 15 European languages and he also spoke um, ancient languages. And so this this guy was um, a genius. This guy was a polyglot. When you look at John Boyce, John Boyce at a very young age was reading and speaking Hebrew and uh, at a very young age also in, in um, he was in universities uh, teaching and speaking Greek. And so these, this is the caliber 
of what we see um, uh, behind the King James Version. And so in the preface, it clearly says they went through uh, all the early versions, the English versions, but it says they, they went through the Dutch, they went through the German, they went through the French. They looked at all the, the evidence. And so these were men who were skilled in Arabic. These They were skilled in Semitic languages. Um, and so sometimes you might find in, in the Hebrew language uh, where there's a word that only appears once. And so understanding other Semitic languages that are related to, to Hebrew, it can be invaluable. And so we see that um, the Reformation was a time when manuscripts had, you know, manus meaning a handwritten, these manuscripts uh, had basically finished, printing had started, it had taken off, and it just took a while for things to settle down. So that's why people are like, oh, where was the Bible before 1611? And it's like, well, it took a little while for these, uh, these ripples to settle down. Just like if I was to put the Bible on the internet, say in the 90s, the internet appears, I might just throw a King James Bible up there, but it might be the wrong edition. There might be the Oxford edition that has, you know, a few printing errors in it. And so then a year later, I'm like, oh, it's got that error, and I change it. It might take five years to iron out all those issues. And But in those days, it just took, you know, but between the time of Tyndale and the time of the King James, it just took a while to iron out those issues. And at the same time, they were working through a lot of the Greek and the issues with the what's retroactively named as the Texas Receptus. And so um, the King James Bible is the culmination of the Reformation. It's the culmination of, of the English. It's the culmination of the Greek and Hebrew. It's a culmination of all the European languages. It's basically the culmination of everything. Um, and so that's why I believe it's a standard. Now, if this had happened in the German language, I would say, yes, that Bible is definitive. If it was, say, if that had happened, say, in Luther's day, just say he got, you know, 60 of the best scholars and they all worked on the translation and they just absolutely ironed out every problem, um, I would go to that. And I would say, well, the German one's better. You know, there are languages and um, language groups that don't have an accurate Bible. Now, I've worked on the Urdu Bible, which is spoken in Pakistan. I lived in Pakistan for a year working on that. So we've done the New Testament and we're about three quarters all the way through the Old Testament. And so the um, I've done that because the, um, sorry, series answering that. Um, I've, we've done that because the other Bibles weren't up to scratch. They were uh, some of the older Bibles even, based on the text receptors, weren't perfect so we're trying to iron out these issues to get it to the place where it is perfect because you can do that you can do that in any language group uh, people say oh no translation is perfect i know some translators who speak luxembourgish they translate for the eu and when i talk to them i say so do you have any problem translating anything like you know over from english or german they say no we can translate everything we're fluent and so when you're fluent in languages like the King James translators were, you don't have an issue with these things. Most modern scholars don't speak Greek. They don't speak Hebrew. They don't speak these things fluently. They don't know these languages. They, they know how to pass things. They look at these languages like it's a Sudoku puzzle. They're trying to figure it all out. But at the end of the day, the King James translators were superior. They had superior translation technique. And I think the rules that King James um, said were, were very good rules, you know, basically uh, that they were to follow the good Bibles of the day, the, the Bishop's Bible, um, you know, don't put marginal notes like the Geneva Bible did. Um, you know, he talked about a, a few other things that when you read through that, I, I can't see any issue with it. Um, and I think the King James Version is unrivaled uh, unless the modern ver a modern version can come out that can be as good as the King James, can be as accurate, can have no geographical errors, no scientific errors, no um, genealogical errors. You know, I, I could sit here all day and just point out just stuff in the NIV and then the next day go through the ESV and then the next day. And the, the problem is 
in five years, they're going to bring out another edition that probably agrees with the King James. And that's what you'll find is these editions, they disagree with each other. And so, and who do we trust with that? Which guru do we go to? Or do we trust that God has preserved his words, that the word of God will be for all generations? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall by no means pass away. That means we're going to be able to find the words of God somewhere. Um, now, I speak fluent English. I can read the King James and I can understand that it's been translated accurately. I can compare it. I can look at uh, the text of Beza and I can go through and say, well, yeah, they've they have created their own TR edition within the King James. Now, as I was saying earlier, had they done a Greek parallel with that, we would follow that Greek text as well, you know, but they didn't. They just, they were commissioned to do an English one. They did the English. And that is why um, Edward Hills, he said that the King James version is its own edition of the TR. And so that's sort of, you know, this is in the 1950s, he said, um, Scribner, uh, the revised version guys of Westcott and Hort, they commissioned Scribner to basically um, create the TR and he went to the King James. So it's not a strange thing. People are, oh, King James only, you're a bunch of weirdos. Well, it's sort of been known throughout history that there's something unique about the King James, that, there's, that this is a definitive standard. And just like I was saying before, you don't want to be lost out in the ocean with a GPS and you're like, I don't know where to go. Um, I just trust in the law. You know, we trust in his words. The Bible is so vitally important. And to sort of be like, oh, we, we don't know where the words of God are. You know, they could be, you know, they're lost and, you know, we, we can never really find them. We're, you know, all everything is all got errors. It's like we mostly just pack up and go home. It, 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 to me, that is not what the Bible says about itself. The Bible clearly says that the words are a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, that um, the word of God is, um, is inspired and that it's profitable for doctrine, it's profitable for reproof, for correction, um, that we can be fully equipped. It's a very important thing. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so if we are... If we don't have that unshakable confidence in the word of God, it just changes absolutely everything. It's a totally, it's almost like a totally different religion. Um, and so, yeah, the issue is with the King James, I personally can't find any errors in it. And I will debate anyone. I will debate on 1 John 5, 7. I'll debate on you know, 1 Timothy 3, 16. I'll debate any part of scripture. And... Um, Usually what I do with these videos and debates, I do follow-up videos. You know, sometimes we leave uh, questions unanswered and things like that. But um, I challenge anyone in the world, Bart Ehrman, I challenge anyone, I will debate you. I believe that this is the only viable apologetic for people to have because if you're standing in front of a Muslim and he can just easily show you a contradiction in your Bible, that means your God is contradicting himself. If there's contradictions in the originals, this is what Bruce Metzger taught. Bruce Metzger, the guy James White and Dan Wallace are saying, go to this guy, he's the guru. He says the originals has mistakes. <laughs> no wonder we are creating a generation of Bart Ehrmans, of Gnostics, of um, of agnostics and atheists and there's just so many people are believing this stuff because um, the academy has been totally taken over by unbelievers and so we need to get back to the words of God um, the King James Bible has been predictable for the last 400 years and to hold it in your hand you know you're holding something powerful when you quote it you know it's the words of a king it has power and I encourage people to um, read the word, believe it, and trust in every syllable of it. All right, Nick Sayers, thank you so much for those closing remarks. All right, PJ, you're up for your closing statement. All righty. Well, I, I, I do want to appreciate uh, telling Nick, uh, I appreciate him willing to debate me today. Um, but it, you know, it, I want to lean off of something that he kind of said in his closing statement about, you know, these were the most, uh, you know, the smartest men during their time in, in, in the 1600s there. 
and and they and they apparently knew this vast knowledge about the Hebrew and the Greek and, and everything of that nature, you know. And I hear that, and it, and it sounds great to say when, when it comes out of somebody's mouth, and it's great to believe, and it's you know we we can look at history in a vacuum and and sometimes even linear mistakenly, and 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 that sounds great. But the fact of the matter is, is I, I'm looking on my screen right now, and I'm finding basic Hebrew grammatical errors. So when I hear somebody tell me that there's no errors, that these were the smartest men around, I'm looking at Jeremiah 36, 26, where it has the name Hamelech. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But the problem with it making that a name, and you, you'll have to read the verse. I don't have time to go into the whole verse. But anytime you see, most of the time, anytime you see the word ha in front of a name, it means it's describing a type of person. So these scholars gave this man, inserted this character, Hamelech, when it just when that word just means the son of the king. It's supposed to be Hamelech. And we see a very similar example in, in Jeremiah 38, 6, where it does the same thing, where it's supposed to be describing a slave of the king, but it gives this person, I'm going to murder the name, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it gives a person, it gives a character, it gives a name to somebody. And I would expect for for somebody to tell me that these were the smartest men alive, that these type of errors would would not be in there. You know, and, and me and Nick had a brief conversation when all this debate was being was being introduced, and I brought up a point that I want to bring up now. Look at Isaiah 14, 12. It talks about the fall of Lucifer. The problem with that, the problem with this particular example, is the word Lucifer had never been in a, any Bible until the Latin language got a hold of it. And then all of a sudden it got filtered down. And then tradition started that Lucifer was this fallen Satan when that wasn't the intent of the word. The word Lucifer was just a one word to describe what we now know as the planet Venus when it's shining near the star near, near the sun in the morning. Instead of us saying the dawn star having two to three or four words to describe that star that's by the sun in the morning, they had one word for it and they called it Lucifer. I, I'm I'm blanking on the name of what it was when it shone in the evening, but it had a, a, a synonymous name for in the evening. But now these errors have caused a whole storyline of conflicts that we created this Lucifer character and made him synonymous with, with the character Satan. So I'm so, supposed to believe that these men were the smartest men alive, but yet when you look at any manuscript that predate the Latin, or never even touched the Latin. The word Lucifer is not found there. It's not a it's not a noun. It's just not there. Plain and simple. It was always the dawn star or the morning star, or however it was described. It was never a name. And never was it supposed to be synonymous with this evil character that we now know as Satan. And 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 that brings up another point, and I'm not trying to influence bad doctrine here, but even that term Satan can be debated. Because anytime you see the word Satan in Hebrew, it's ha Satan, the Satan, the adversary. Now I'm getting off on a tangent a little bit, but those are just some examples of how easily those little things slip through. And these are supposed to be the smartest men during that time. But these these grammatical errors just just slip by. I would expect more. And not only did it just slip by them, it slipped by all editions. And and needless to say, it's not just in the King James Version. But we're supposed to hold this King James Version as a high standard. Shouldn't it be set aside? Shouldn't it have a different standard on its own? It's God's word. It's pure. It's perfect, right? So why why have we created this, this evil entity that's historically not uh, factual? So for me to sit here and, and, and also with the examples that I presented before, how can I, I believe in John 1, 1, I believe that God is his word. I need to hold more reverence to myself. My body is a temple. That doesn't just mean what you put in it. That means up here too. And I need to have more reverence for his word. And it's sitting there it's going, ah, they're just grammatical errors, no big deal. But if it happens over here, we're all up in arms about it, supposedly. And and like I like when Nick asked me before, you know, he asked me, "What are the originals?" I don't know. 
that is irresponsible irresponsible for any critical thinker to say i know for a fact that this says exactly what what should have been said when we don't even have the premise he said it in his closing statement he quoted somebody that said that the originals were wrong so what where do we get our resources? What do we lean off of? Just the 1611 and let's just do it and throw up our arms? That is irresponsible, and it's irresponsible as a Christian to do so. It's this infatuation that we have to have this, this tangible thing in our hand to say it's perfect, and somehow that gives us more authority over each other. It's for spiritual doctrine, and it's just dangerous in, in general. How many horrible people throughout history have done very similar things? And their followers took that into what it shouldn't have been. Now, I'm not saying that the King James Bible is that much, but I know for a fact how cultish, and yes, I'm using that word, I, I try to avoid, but I know how easy it is for the cult-like behavior to spin out of this thing. All you have to do is go to King James Version Facebook pages and look at the comments, and you see one person disagree even slightly. And you, you see they're told they're of Satan, that they're going to hell, that, they're, that, that, that they don't deserve to go to heaven. And that mentality spirals, and it's unbiblical. And I think we as Christians need to be more responsible with how we are con conveying something being preserved. I think we need to critically think about what we consider as preserved. I think we need to stop wanting absolutes all the time and wanting to have a tangible item. I think it's highly irresponsible and I think we need to do better as Christians and stop and saying, well, when we do it, it's okay. But when you do it over here, ESV, RSV, whatever other three to four, it's all of a sudden wrong. And I'm going to yield my time. All right. Thank you guys for another great, great debate. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and transition into our Q and a, and we have a whole bunch of questions, guys. Unfortunately, they're heavy for you, Nick. And I'm sure you probably expected it. Nick. <laughs> they are heavy, Nick, they are heavy, heavy. So, let me pull some of these questions up real quick. All right, let me get them up real quick. Let me take that down. All right, starting off, I have some super chats, so I'm gonna start with my super chats first, and then we'll go into it. This question has two parts to it, so bear with me. You'll see the question pop up at the bottom of the screen. All right, so, Thank you for the super chat. That's Rob Rowe, a uh, good buddy of mine. It's ironic that Revelations 22, 19 in the King James Version is based on human error. Erasmus ret retrojected the Latin back into Greek without realizing that it was corrupted. All right, here's the second part to that question. A scribe miscopied the correct word lingo, which is tree, as libro, which is book, since N and R have a similar typographical shape, or R is half the N shape. What are your thoughts on that, Nick? Um, I think it's error upon error upon error. So there's usually, uh, people say that Erasmus only had one Greek manuscript for the book of Revelation. But actually in the book of Revelation itself, in his own annotations, he clearly says that he referenced several Greek copies and he would often talk about copies in the plural. And so that should in, in itself write off the whole thing that Erasmus only had one, the Reuchlin's manuscript. Uh, that, that should write that off. But people just run with that and they overlook what Erasmus was saying and say, oh, he was probably lying or having a senior moment or whatever. Um, the whole thing is they, they claim that the last six verses were back translated um, from the Latin. Now, he did that with Reuchlin's because the last page had fallen off. So he wrote out his own copy of this manuscript for himself and for his printing team. But that was only just one manuscript that he had. The, the guys from Aldous, he lived with Aldous for 
um, the eldest printers. He lived there for eight months in Venice. He was one of the best um, printers in Europe at the time. And so he, um, he got their manuscripts of Revelation and got them to the printer. And so he clearly says that's exactly what he did. And so um, what people claim, modern version proponents claim that Erasmus, he back translated the Latin into Greek but then in an, at the annotations of Erasmus, he clearly says in this particular verse that he found something called homoeteuton, which is basically when you, when you have similar endings of words or the end of a sentence looks the same as the sentence below it. And so you can skip a whole line. So he said that's exactly what it was. But how did he know it was that in the Greek how did he know that if he'd actually only just back translated it from the Latin? So it's actually lie upon lie upon lie, uh, false story upon false story. What you'll find with Erasmus, there's so many false stories about, you know, he rushed to print. He was sort of slipping on banana peels all over the place. Uh, Erasmus, he only put the commie Johannium in because of a bet. All these things have been thoroughly discredited for years and years and years, but people just continually parrot James White, parrots it, um, uh, a whole bunch of other guys parrot all this stuff. And so what you find with this particular issue, it's homoeotegia time. So, so certain things override the amount of manuscripts that we have. If, if the Bible says one plus one equals 73, you know it's wrong. Uh, even uh, Dan Wallace said if um, we had certain words, like if it was, if it was to form a more perfect onion, we would know, no, it's to form a more perfect union. We would just instinctively know these things. Erasmus was fluent in Greek. He was part of the Byzantine school in Venice. He hung around with printers like Aldus for many, many years, and uh, he knew his stuff. And so he spotted homoeoteton in the Greek manuscripts here, and that overrides the majority. Uh, what would you say... Um... Because apparently uh, another comment from Centennial Apologetics, Erasmus had no manuscript for Revelation 22. And he said, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, Erasmus had Reuchlin's. It was only missing the last six verses. So he wrote them down from the Latin. And that was, he. wherever he went, he was copying manuscripts. So he visited the Reuchlin manuscript, he copied it all out, and the last six verses are missing, so he wrote it out. But then he got a note to his uh, to his guys to get the reading from Aldus, from the Aldean guys. And so they had yet to publish theirs, as theirs was published in 1518. And so they had Greek manuscripts. Uh, Erasmus, in his own annotations, he clearly says in his annotations on Revelation, he used Greek copies. He talks about, he used the Greek of Lorenzo Valla as well. And Valla had examined many manuscripts. So he was using all sorts of things. He wasn't just using the Reuchlin's one. And this is one of the things, oh, Re Revelation has all these variants. That's because the narrative is that you only use one manuscript. So whenever there's a departure from that, they say, oh, he used the Vulgate. But it's just, um, it's just false concept upon false. You have to peel back these layers and then you realize, um, I guess they, it's good fiction, but it's, um, it's not what Erasmus wrote in annotations. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, PJ? What are, you, what are your thoughts on this issue? Well, I would, you wouldn't say that Nick uh, pro uh, probably has had more in depth with, you know, the Texas Receptus. I'm, I've gained familiar with this work over the last couple of months and, um, you know, great, great work on your part, Nick. Uh, that, that's really good stuff. Um, I, you know, there's the point. It's hard to really bring it all together because we find a lot of the same thing happening on both sides of the aisle, whether we're talking about Alexandrian text, whether there's so much convolution, there's so much debate. And, and we're supposed to believe that it just happened in all linear form. And we know that that's not the case. We know that we know that the Texas Receptus that every time it was translated or retranslated or, or redone, I guess is the better better word to say that it didn't always match up. It didn't match up majority of the time, 
And then the Bibles that sprung from, from it didn't even match up either. And then the, the, the King James himself used the seven Bibles to create the King James Version. And then we saw the errors coming from that. So my 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 uh, response may be a little bit more limited than, than Nick's, uh, admittedly, but uh, that's where I stand on. All right, all right. Uh, next question, uh, some more Super Chats. All right, it says, why does the ESV have Jesus in Jude 5 about the Exodus while the King James Version has Lord and is clearly missing the ESV's clear fact that Jesus is Yahweh? And that's for me, is it, Mo? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, Nick, you can go ahead, go for it first. Okay, so this is one of the things: is the name of Jesus wasn't known to the Old Testament saints, and so when the ESV came out, they actually predicted that this would be a variant um, that was going to come into the main Greek text or the uh, the Nestle Alan Twenty Eighth Edition, and so the ESV came out with this reading before the Greek came in, and so. Um, what it does, it basically predicts, um, it's like they already knew Jesus. Uh, they knew his name and everything. But the Bible is very clear that that only became known to humanity uh, in Matthew chapter 1. It says that the angels said, you shall call his name Jesus. It's not like they already knew us, oh, we're following Jesus, you know, or Jesus led them out. No, and so what it is, it's the heart of reading. So they're, um, they've gone with the rule the hardest reading, but why don't they go with the hardest reading all over the Bible? Because it would look ridiculous because there are so many manuscripts with so many strange and bizarre readings because, you know, there were Gnostics, there was Marcion, there was a whole bunch of people who they had no interest in, um, you know, truth or, or maintaining truth. They just wrote whatever they wanted. And so you have manuscripts with strange readings, uh, like you have, you know, 666 is pretty much the yeah, everyone knows that's the mark of the beast, but there is one manuscript that has 616. And, um, yeah, well, that's the hardest reading. That will probably appear in modern Bibles because it's the hardest reading. And so what we see here is even though people will claim, oh, it's, you know, it's the deity of Christ is, is more preserved and everything, um, I think it's a, a compensation because of the Unitarians who worked on the Westcott and Hawke Committee, like George Mann Smith, um, these guys didn't believe in the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, they they were rejected by the Church of Eng England. Uh, lots of upheaval about these guys being on the translation committee. And they loved the fact that 1057 was gone, uh, that, you know, God manifest in the flesh was he appeared in the body. It, you know, they loved the fact that these were changed. And so now what we see is people who do believe in the Trinity are realizing there's this massive vacuum and the Trinitarian verses have been taken out. And so they're trying to compensate it with these other verses and trying to squeeze the Trinity into a lot of these other verses where it doesn't really even apply. PJ, any thoughts? To be quite honest with you, my, my response to this would probably be another topic of debate, uh, just because of the pure fact that we, we have to have a deep understanding of Hebrew culture to be able to understand the, this, this difference here. Um, there's so much to unravel and unpack with this. Uh, but I will say this, that despite tradition and how we are raised in our churches today, to think that the Hebrews had a foreknowledge, some super foreknowledge that Jesus was coming down the line is inherently true. And you can ask any Hebrew, Orthodox Hebrew that is alive today who studies the apologetics of their religion would tell you that they had no report about Jesus. And there's so much impact there. I don't want to <laughs> veer off, but that, that's pretty much where, where I come from on that one. Uh, I think we have a response from the idea of the name of Jesus or Yeshua. Uh, let me, and Mr. Rob Rowe, and it says, rubbish, Yeshua was the sixth most common male name. So um, I think he's getting at, you know, the idea that the name was actually pretty popular um, back then, so it shouldn't have been an issue with the, as far as the translation is concerned. Yeah, I think um, yeah, specifically uh, Jude um, one five is is saying Jesus led them out, um, and so I, you know, just because Yeshua is a popular name, it doesn't specifically say that that's you know the name of the Lord or it's you know to do with deity. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I don't think that that really um, makes much of a difference uh, just by the name being popular. I mean, um, there are plenty of popular Hebrew names, but it doesn't mean that they knew exactly that was going to be the name of the Messiah. All right. Uh, and <laughs> another response. And <laughs> Another response, he says, stop babbling. Jesus equals better theological reading. It's a better theological reading for Jesus, and, and it should be supported. The King James Version doesn't support it. What do you say, Nick? Well, I haven't, because uh, I haven't got the bandwidth to have my other laptop um, lined up <laughs> with all the articles, um, yeah. I could just go to, most of the time, I just go to articles on this issue, and I just point out that usually it is a reading in either Vaticanus or Sinaiticus, depending on you know, how the scholars felt that day or how the Jesuit Carlo Martini, uh, who was on the Nestle Island United Bible Society board, or how Bruce Metzger felt that day, or, you know, just depending on how their reasoning is, uh, it just th that's how this reading would get in there. And so say Bruce Metzger, he might've said, you know, we want this reading now, but um, this, might not be in the Bible in five years. They might, because they've done that a lot. You know, and that's the thing, the debate we're having now will change because the Bibles are constantly changing. And so many readings that I've gone, oh, that's a bad reading and I've studied all that, and then the new versions have just smoothed it out and they're, they're gone with it, with the King James reading or with the correct reading. And so, um, yeah. All right, let me uh, let me here go another one. It says, why were the King James version translated sloppy with the manuscript of First Samuel one twenty four corrupted from the Septuagint and the Syriac that read three year old bull and not three bullocks? Okay, I've fired up my internet, so if I start lagging, <laughs> is uh. <laughs> This guy's picking a fight. You put your pizza to the fire here, Nick. I'm sorry, yeah. man. I'm sitting over here chilling. No, that's fine. They're, they're, they're on you, Nick, man. They're on you, man. He's, he's trying to get you, man. Okay, so we're looking at one Samuel. Um, one. Okay, so... <sighs> While Nick is looking it up, what, what, do you, what are yeah. your thoughts on this, PJ? What, what are your thoughts, man? I think it goes back to my first answer of, of the other question. You know, there is so much to impact, not just with Hebrew culture, but the Hebrew language itself. You know, the, the omission of vowels and the, the way it can be easily misinterpreted when you bring it on down the line. So it, for me, this could go either way. Um, you know, I, I haven't looked at this specifically. Um, my background is a little bit more in the Hebrew side of things. I, I enjoy that on my free time. Um, but I think that the simple answer, the layman answer, is that it's a whole lot more complicated. There's so much to impact. And not only that, we're looking at Hebrew that's not even used today, really, in, in some respects. So that also gives another layer. Not only that, but the translations that come all the way down. So it's uh, sometimes very, very, very hard to just package it all pretty and just present, like, here's the answer, because there's so much behind it. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Cool. Nick, uh, yeah, you have that response, man. <clears throat> yeah, I couldn't find that specific response. It's, I guess it's pretty hard because in this debate, we're debating like a concept. Is the Bible, you know, King James Bible correct and all the rest of it? And going right into, you know, tiny, minute little details can be hard. And I, I can't find um, this variant mentioned in any of the websites I just frequented and or in my website. Uh, whether where it's an issue um it might be somewhere but at the moment i can't specifically find it but i would just answer this question question with a question like jesus did and i would say well you've got um, one samuel uh chapter one verse 24 here with this so-called error uh what about if we just skip over a couple of pages and go to one samuel 13 1 where the esv read reads saul was dot 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 years old when he began to reign and dot 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 two years over Israel it actually doesn't have the words where the King James says Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel so it has the words there so dot 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 is the actual ESV reading so um, you know how can I if, if 
the ASB guys don't know what's there. How can I trust that they've got it right here? That's how I would answer that question in a roundabout way. All right. <clears throat> Next question. The same guy. Got them super chats, man. Got to get them in. <laughs> Why did the King James Version use the corrupted manuscript of Isaiah 5311 of the travel of the uh, travel of his soul? No resurrection predicted. When uh, D DSS reads, he will see light. Okay, so uh, why did the King James Version use corrupt um, Masoretic text? So I think um, basically this guy is saying the Masoretic text is corrupt. Um, of Isaiah 53.11, of the travail of his soul, no resurrection predicted. When the Dead Sea Scrolls reads, he will see light. Okay, so um, I, again, I can't seem to find... These are sort of not your usual type of things there's I, I found 500 errors just in the new king james so even just to go through just the, that's a texas receptors edition just to go through them and put them in my website takes quite a long time let alone thousands of others and there's you know about a thousand english bibles out there and so um this is just uh, sometimes it can be you know a bit vague but um yeah if, if people want to talk about more common ones that are usually found on the internet um, or on my web page i can instantly chat about them but it's pretty hard just to um yeah talk about these obscure ones any thoughts pj again i, I hate to sound like a broken record but we're talking about hebrew scriptures here and it's extremely hard uh with hebrew scriptures uh to to not make a mistake. Um, and, and I go back to what I said before, I hate sounding like I'm being redundant, but it really is. It comes down to a lot of understanding about what they were trying to say and putting yourself in the optics of those people then and stop assuming that we have the foreknowledge that they knew what they knew when they may not have. And then you add the layers of language and everything above it. It's just, it's a very convoluted topic. That's why I like it. And I don't want to spend a bunch of time talking about it right here because it's not the, the outlet for this debate, but um I, I just think it's way more complicated than just a simple answer all right all right hey nick another response man to your, to your <laughs> he said the point is no ancient nearest practice or israelite practice had three bulls the only you they only used three year old bull the king j version is sloppy here cool okay well um i guess because you know I don't have that information right in front of me. Um, I'll just say that that's, I'll look into that. And what I'll do, I'll make a little uh, video and put them on Facebook and about that particular question. It might take me a few weeks, a um, little bit busy, but I'll answer your question and I'll put it on my website as well. And so if you look up um, the, I think it was the one in Isaiah and also this one, which I'm not sure where it is, but uh, yeah, it'll be there. Same guy, different question though. Why does a King James Version lack the 14th verse in Psalms 145, 13 to 15? That reads, God is faithful about everything he says and merciful in everything he does. Okay, 145. That's for you, Nick. I'm just going to assume that's for you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, not even the uh, Dan Wallace's NET Bible that doesn't even do this. Um, so it's not in all the modern versions. It's sort of these are sort of questions that are pretty grey. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So well, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. They're a bit left field. Um, okay. And I think the the issue is, um, it's a bit like when when I'm James White debate Jack Mormon, say for example, um, James that the concept should we read the King James, and then James White kept going to Revelation sixteen five, which was this tiny little one word verse, and I've written a whole book on that issue, and um, 
but in the debate, it was sort of going from this huge concept to this tiny little thing. And Jack Mormon just kept saying, look, I don't have that information right in front of me. And it sort of made for a bit of a poor debate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, Jack Mormon just kept saying, oh, I don't I don't know. You know, I, I could look it up. It's going to take me 20 minutes to look it up. And, and so I think, yeah, these, these questions are, I'll answer them later. And, um, but yeah, I, I don't want to just give a sloppy answer. Um, I think that'll waste it in time. <laughs> Any thoughts, PJ? Well, as he, as Nick was, uh, and I can sympathize with him. He's getting hit hard right now. So I won't lie, but, uh, but that's, that's where we're at. But, um, but I think this is a perfect example of why I think this, the, the translators, they wrote in the preface of the King James Version that it's in, important to even read other translations. Because how would we have known that it was missing from the King James Version unless we collaborated other sources to tell us that? So I think there, there's something to be said there that it, it is important that we do study other versions. Because sometimes it can fill in the holes and sometimes... Vice versa, the King James can fill in those holes. I think that's preservation. And I said it earlier, I, that's why I don't believe preservation is just a tangible item in your hand. Sometimes preservation can be multiple things brought together. I mean, don't you think that's a good point, Nick? I mean, we can use the other versions to be able to fill in those gaps, as PJ said. That's, that's, I find that pretty helpful, don't you think? Uh, I think what it does is that the verses are either God's word or they're not. And so what we see, we'd say with this verse that's being spoken about, it's not in the NET of Dan Wallace, so he doesn't think they should be there. The NASB doesn't have it, so you know James White was a consultant for that, so he probably doesn't believe they should be there either. But then we see it's in the ESB, um, and so we see it's in the Roman Catholic editions. And so to me, that's utter confusion. The modern versions aren't agreeing with each other. And so... Um, you know, to, to me, from uh, someone on the outside just looking at this and saying, well, they don't know if these, you know, 18, verse, 18 words should be in there, uh, it's a big deal. And so, um, you know, some people, like, I'm not sure exactly where this guy finds them, probably the Dead Sea Scrolls or something like that he mentioned before. Um, but the thing is, yeah, if we found a manuscript tomorrow that said, you know, God didn't so love the world that he didn't give his only begotten, well, we just run with that. You know, it's like, I think the thing is, all these new finds, uh, many times we're neglecting that God has preserved his word throughout the ages, and we have had his word throughout the ages, and it's been God promised to preserve his words to us. And so um, just all of a sudden now we're adding a verse. It's like, um, or adding and subtracting. I, I believe it's, it's not correct. Okay, okay. All right, so we have another question. A couple more questions, fellas, then we'll close this thing out. Can you ask them their opinion on the Latin Vulgate? Is it reliable? PJ, you can go with this one first. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> um. I have some issues with the Latin Vulgate, and I gave an example of that, um, you know, with the, the Lucifer complex and how English has done that. And that's not the Latin Vulgate's fault, so I'll, I'll yield on that. Um, I think it was good for what it was worth, for what they had at the time. Uh, just like you can say that about almost anything, the Tyndale Bible, the Wycliffe Bible, it, it was good for its time. Now, if you want me to point out specific errors or if you want me to point out specific problems, that that we'll be here all night, just like with some of the questions that Nick got. But I will say that, you know, there, there is room and there has been proven points that it does contain errors. Um, so I um, that on it. I, haven't, I don't know very well for me to study it. I would have to actually have a linear, you know, kind of a comparison and just compare what it was. And uh, that's not really my background. So to be fair, I, you know, I would have to look into that. All right. What do you say, Nick? Is the Latin Vulgate reliable? From what I can understand, the Latin Vulgate was essentially um, good uh, in its initial construction. Um, some people like to pit the Latin against the Greek. Uh, I think one of the concepts about the Textus Receptus is it uses all information. When you look at the text of 
um, Biza, he was um, working with Janius, who was an expert in Arabic, and Tremelius, who was a Jewish guy, read fluent Hebrew, um, and he was working on the Syriac. He did the Syriac edition. So when you read uh, Beza's annotations, he's often times saying the Syriac will say this and all the rest of it. So when you look at Erasmus, Erasmus, he actually had worked on his own Latin translation. He believed that what happened was Jerome did a good edition, but it had become corrupted over the years. And so he was just tidying up the, um, the Latin of Jerome. And basically that is what happened, that is what sort of formulated the text receptors because he started to gra grab Greek manuscripts manuscripts and then he was looking at both the latin and the greek and so usually within the circles of the textus receptus uh there are three in the closed class of witnesses we have the greek that is a foundation the byzantine greek and then we have the latin because there's ten thousand latin manuscripts and they were huge they were everywhere and so they are a reflection of what was in the original greek but we go by the greek the latin polishes the greek the greek corrects the latin but we are guided by the early church writers. And so we look at how they quoted things. Um, you know, many of the Latin, many of the Greek uh, fathers, uh, I call them church writers. I don't like to call them fathers, but they, they were writing all these things. They were quoting scripture. And so we can look at those three witnesses and that's pretty much where we get the Texas receptors from. So the Latin has, uh, was good. It became corrupted. Erasmus worked on it. He corrected it. And but as it stands today, um, if you were to type in you know, the Latin Vulgate and just look at the one on the internet, uh, usually it's it's not a very good uh, edition. Okay. And here is our other question. It says there are older manuscripts that read differently than the King James version in some places. One of them is right. What will be needed to prove to you that the older was actually correct? This question is for Nick. Well, um, I guess it just has to agree with um, with a bunch of things. Like it has to uh, um, have a correct grammar. It has to have um, been used and translated and um been known to people, um, like, you know, say, like I was talking about 616 or 666, you know, if you were to say 616 is, is you know, the, the correct reading, I mean, where has there been a community who has believed that? You know, if I can look at, say, the Comi Johannium, I can show you that it's in 95% of the Latin. So it's not in the Greek. Um, but the Greek church had lots of issues with Trinity and all sorts of things. And so some there were some Arians who ran the Byzantine Empire who didn't like that verse. And so we can look at things, and we can also see in 1 John 5, 7, where if you don't have 1 John 5, 7, in it, it creates a massive grammatical blunder. It's called a solecism. And so it's you can just see this car wreck there. And um, you can see that the verse is supposed to be there, but it's, it's not there. The... the, the the genders don't match up. And so um, things like that, they have, it has to fit. And so um, yeah, there would, there's lots of factors that come into it. You know, it, it comes into usage, but also preservation. Jesus says that his words will be preserved, that people would have access to it. If it's been hidden in a cave for, you know, nearly 2,000 years, you know, for 1,800 years, and then we find this reading, it's, oh, it's 616 now change the Bibles, um, I'm not going to run with that. It has to be, there's a whole bunch of factors that have to come into play for, for the Word of God to change. All right, PJ, what are your thoughts? I actually agree with Nick for the most part on most of what he said. You do have to critically look at it. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about anyway tonight. You know, it's hard to just say because something is older that it's correct. There's many older things that aren't correct, you know, so that there does have a textual criticism that goes behind that sort of thing and uh it, you know it, it has to be taken seriously you know and we talked about that today too all right all right and this is a last question mr robert rose showed up again <laughs> psalms 145 is a acrostic psalm i think i pronounced that right acrostic acrostic psalm acrostic. 22 verses uh, for 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The King James Version has 21 verses. Thus, the psalm is incomplete in the KJV. 
What are your thoughts on that, Nick? <laughs> and I guess, but if I was a critical text guy, I would say the um, the harder reading is the better, which if you've got an acrostic um, psalm, so basically what you see, let's say Psalm chapter 31, where it talks about the virtuous woman. Every verse starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's a bit like Psalm 119. You know, it's got, you know, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, and it goes through. And so um, that's what he's saying here is it's got, you know, these this alphabet, but it's missing one. And so um, he's saying, well, it's missing. It must be inserted there. But perhaps there's another reason why it's missing. And the thing is, like I was saying, it goes against the hardest reading. Isn't that the hardest reading? Why aren't you going with it this time? And so that's what I always say. The hardest reading rule applies until it doesn't. And scholar goes, well, I don't like that, or no, I want to, I want to put it in, or and so it just comes, uh, it, it just relies on the whim of of a translator. PJ, uh, sound like a broken record doing this whole question and answer because it's all been for him, and you know, but uh, but I, I, I go back to what I said about you know. The, you can't just depend on words. That's why it's important. And I think that's why the translators, the men who wrote the King James Version said themselves that we need to study. And they gave examples in the Bible of how the apostles enforced using other sources to identify what's being preserved and what's not. So I, I rest heavenly on the men and I, and, and I'll yield to Nick, I yield to any King James only advocate. I like the King James Version. It's sitting right here in front of me. It's the Bible that I prefer because I grew up with it. I understand it. I, I think it's beautiful. And I, I gave those compliments in my opening statement. Um, but I do think that there is a need for us to be able to see uh, what is, else is out there. Because at the same time, you know, what's the best way to build up a muscle? It's to resist it. What's the best way to do what you believe if you don't know what you don't believe? So I think it's very important that we observe these others and study them and not critic criticize them and say, oh, they're just for Satan from Satan just because they're not the King James Version. I think we need to accept them in and let us learn from that and then create a better text from that. And a final statement from Mr. Robert Rowe. He says that uh, that Proverbs 31, not acoustic, not Psalms 31. That's Proverbs 31. Did I say Psalms? Did I? Sorry about that. Yeah. I guess I, 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 hey, they, they're out there listening, Nick. They, <laughs> they quick with I'm not as perfect man. as the King James Bible. The King James <laughs> Bible is perfect. I'm not perfect. Uh. All right. Good stuff, fellas, man. That was a great debate, great discussion. I appreciate you guys uh, being so kind to each other. Uh, sometimes debates, man, they can get going, man. They talk it over each other and it's really hard to understand. But I think I appreciate you guys just for the candor and the kindness you guys showed each other, man. So that is it. And um, as always, you know, I always send gifts out to those who participate in debates. Um, Nick, it may be a little bit difficult because you're in Australia. I don't know if you have a uh, somewhere in the U.S. I can send it. Um, maybe they can get it to you. Um, how they have her way. Um, but I do want to see you guys gifts uh, for you guys. Take your time at your schedule away from your families for preparation for this. And uh, it's just a kind gesture from me, from the gospel truth to you. And uh, once again, you're now in the, the gospel truth family. So uh, I thank you guys for joining me this episode. And hopefully we can, maybe we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks, Marlon. All right. All right. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, PJ. Nice to meet you. You too. All right, all right. All right folks. Another great one. Um, and this, once again, I enjoy these KJV debates because it's a weak area of mine. So as I'm hearing these guys debate, um, I'm taking this stuff in, right? I'm, I'm giving this stuff. I'm juggling this stuff. And I'm trying to say, okay, where are the strong arguments? Where the arguments that need work, you know, and I think that's what you guys should do out there as well. As you guys are listening to these arguments, uh, as the concerns of KJV and the King James Version Bible and things like that, 
Uh, what are some areas where you find that you may need work on and understanding a proper representation of a KJV onlyist or somebody who holds a KJ King James version only uh, onlyism? So it's it's important that we are able to understand arguments, see where the errors are, and conclude our positions. Right. Um, so I thank Nick and I thank PJ for allotting this time for this debate. And once again, it was one of the more, more enjoyable ones. And I, I pray that out there, you guys really enjoyed it as well. And um, that you uh, look forward to, you know, perhaps having another one between PJ and Nick or Nick and somebody else, you know. And Nick put the challenge out there, you know. He said, if you guys are open to debating him, he's open, you know. So he's open to, to getting in the ring with anybody, man. The, the, the gospel truth octagon, you know. Uh, get in here and battle some theological concepts, you know, some textual issues, man. So... It was fun. It was fun. But with that, let me go ahead and uh, go over some some announcements that we have coming up of shows that we some announcement shows that we have coming up. All right. All right. Coming up July 17th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We have a big debate, man. This is going to be a great one. I hope that you are subscribed on the Gospel Truth page for this one and liking on, on the Facebook page. I have Eric Hernandez and Arn Ra. Uh, does the soul exist? That's coming up July 17th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. After that, I have Emilio Ramos uh, versus Tom Jump. Another great debate that's scheduled, man. I'm sure this would be a great one as well. Can atheism provide consistent and justifiable reasons to hold to objective morals? Uh, that's coming up July 21st at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. After that, I have another great debate. Jim Majors versus Mike Jones, Inspiring Philosophy. Uh, was Jesus buried in a tomb? This coming up July 24th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then lastly, I have uh, a repeat of a debate that should have took place uh, some time ago, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I have Jack Shannon versus Stephen Boyce. Does the Bible teach that remarriage is always sinful? That's coming up July 27th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember that time. Don't forget. All right. But that is just the next four shows coming up on the Gospel Truth. Once again, make sure you're liking and subscribing on the Gospel Truth so you can stay in the loop. Get stay in the loop. Don't get out the loop of what the gospel truth. We are here to engage cultural Christian truth, and we are here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the masses of those who need to hear it. All right. With that said, I pray that you are doing what you need to do to stay close to God, to stay close to Christ, and make sure that you are preaching the gospel to everyone who needs to hear it. All right. Preach the gospel to the masses, and God will do the work in regenerating and turning people away from their sin and bringing them to a salvific relationship with him. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. And I thank you for joining me once again. Uh, that's not what I want to do. Uh, with that said, thank you for joining me. May God bless you and may God keep you. I'm gone.